Thank you very much. That's helpful. Well, good morning, everyone. That's kind of weak. Monday morning, good morning. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Georges Benjamin, and I'm the executive director at the American Public Health Association uh, here in Washington, DC. Um, and I just want to start by welcoming you all here uh, to our great forum. Um, as you know, um, the occasion today is that um, the U.S. firearm injuries are at epidemic proportions. And we have um, over 100,000 people who are shot annually, um, over 270 per day on average. Uh, almost 40,000 people um, uh, die each year uh, from these um, firearm um, injuries. Um, and in 2017, the CDC actually counted at 30, 39,377. Um, it's also in addition to the human toil uh, involved in this and the heartbreak, uh, costs our, our nation over $229 billion. Um, so it's not just um, the deaths and injuries, but it has an extraordinary fiscal toll on our nation. These are um, complex issues, and um, of course everything involving people is complex. But I want to just point out the solutions are also very complex. And no single policy solution, despite many of our policymakers who want to have that one policy that's going to fix all this, um, no single policy solution is going to solve it all. So today, um, we're going to have a series of discussions around policies that we believe work. Um, and it's important to build that on um, a, a solid framework. And we, I think we all believe that universal background checks uh, are the core foundation for effective policy. Uh, and so you're going to hear us talk about this, but through the context of all the policies uh, that we're having today. Uh, we brought together some of the world's leading experts to discuss a series of policies that have a strong evidence base. Again, we call these policies that work. Uh, and our goal is to inform the leaders um, that are having this debate on the Hill right now uh, and down in the White House um, to enable them to take action. Now, the format today is that we're going to basically have two panels, um, and those speakers will get up, make their presentations, and then, of course, we'll have a, hopefully a vigorous Q&A uh, following each panel. So I'm going to get an opportunity to moderate the first panel, where we're going to talk about extreme risk protection orders, stronger protections for victims of domestic violence, licensing, um, also that in the context of background checks, and restricting assault weapons in large capacity magazines. Um, with that, I'm going to bring up very quickly my colleague, uh, Josh Sharfstein, who's going to just run through the, the second panel's program and um, a couple other announcements. Josh. Thank you very much, Georges. Uh, my name is Josh Sharfstein. I am a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins and the director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, which is co-sponsor with the American Public Health Association of this great forum. So the second panel will cover a different set of policies that work, including interventions with high-risk individuals, hospital-based interventions, uh, projects to reduce blight in urban areas and their impact on violence, and finally, we'll talk about the importance of gun violence research. And for each of these topics, as Dr. Benjamin said, we have uh, brought in from around the country uh, one of the top experts to go through the evidence. Let me just say that um, the American Health Initiative is, is proud to sponsor this event. Um, we are an initiative focused on major challenges to health in the United States, including violence. And you can find more about uh, the work that we do, including fellowship opportunities at Johns Hopkins at AmericanHealth.jhu.edu. 
We also want to make uh, today uh, participatory, so we know that we have a lot of people watching the webcast right now, so thank you. And uh, second of all, we're going to be on Twitter with a hashtag, Gun Policies That Work, and you can follow at Public Health for the American Public Health Association and at American Health for the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. So uh, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Benjamin, for the first panel. So for our, for our first panel, um, we're going to talk about extreme risk protection orders. Um, we're going to have two speakers, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Swanson, uh, who's professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Duke University School of Medicine and a visiting scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research. And he's going to be followed by Shannon Fraterioli. Uh, Dr. Fraterioli is an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and his core faculty at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research. If you want to know a little bit more about them, their bios are in your folders. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Jeff. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I think of uh, gun violence in America as a puzzle, and one of the missing pieces in that puzzle of gun violence prevention has been what to do about people who clearly pose a, a serious risk of misusing a firearm, of harming uh, someone else or themselves, but they can legally possess guns. Uh, they can legally purchase guns. They don't have any of, they don't fall into any of the categories that would prohibit them from purchasing or possessing a gun, uh, such as having a felony criminal record or having a history of involuntary commitment. Um, but people around them know that they pose a risk. I mean, this could be your Uncle Floyd, who, you know, who served his country honorably in the Air Force, and, but he's just had a really bad year, and now he's drinking heavily. And one night, uh, he, he takes his own deer rifle and ends his life, and it's a horrible tragedy for everybody, and people knew this. So extreme risk protection orders are designed for situations like that, among others. Um, Uncle Floyd would have passed a background check. You know, background checks are necessary, they're important, but they wouldn't necessarily deter uh, someone from misusing a gun in a situation like that. Um, so, you know, if Uncle Floyd isn't necessarily, all, he wouldn't always uh, pose a risk. Maybe he would have gotten over it, would have gotten some help. And uh, so the, the, the features of, of a risk protection order are, uh, are as follows. Um, they're, they're time limited. They're not forever. They give police officers the clear legal authority to search for and remove firearms from, from a risky person at a risky time. Um, so they're, they're uh, and they're, it's a civil court process. It's, it's not uh, criminalizing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a person, uh, there's legal due process that's built in at the front end. Uh, typically, um, what would happen is if you live in a state like this, you can call the police. The police look into it, and they get a, an order, a, an ex parte, parties not present order from a judge who removes the guns, and the police officers can then remove the guns. And then within two weeks, there's a hearing, and all the parties can be heard. And at that point... Uh, the state has the burden of proving by clear and convincing evidence typically that uh, this indiv individual continues to pose a risk of harm to others or self, and then the guns can be retained for, uh, for up to a year. So um, let's uh, flash back to the year 2013, right after the Sandy Hook shooting, and I'm going to show you a map of all the states that had a law like this. There were two, Connecticut and Indiana. It's kind of interesting, these two states, right? I mean, Connecticut, the Democrats are in charge of the state legislature, and in Indiana, they, the Republicans have a supermajority. These states differ on a lot of uh, parameters that have to do with possession of guns and the uh, strength of other gun laws and so on. Uh, but they were both passed after a, after a concern about a mass shooting, and it was a response of the state legislature to a, to a concern and public outrage over that. Now, let's flash forward to 2019. That's the map. 
All those dark blue shaded uh, states have some version of an extreme risk protection order law. The first one after Connecticut and Indiana was in California after the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearms Policy thought about this and developed this, uh, this idea a little bit further where family members would be able to go uh, directly to a judge and petition for a, a uh, removal of guns. And the, the light shaded ones are states that have proposed this and this is already out of date. There are other states that are not even on there. Uh, you know, so if you think nothing has happened, nothing happens at all in terms of gun violence prevention laws, take a look at this. A lot is happening at the state level. So what do we know from research about whether these work? Well, our research group has conducted studies in both Connecticut and Indiana. And what we found was, notwithstanding the laws were passed out of concerns for mass shootings, as they have been used, most of the time, two-thirds of the time, they're used for a suicide concern. Um, across the age span, uh, mostly men. Um, about, you know, one in four or one in five times there's a, a homicidal ideation or threat. Um, about the same for alcohol or drug into uh, intoxication. Acute mental illness or dementia is a minority of those. So it's, this is not about mental illness diagnosis, although it's going to capture the proportion of people who might have a mental health problem who, um, who are posing a risk, at least for a period of time. The average number of guns removed per person, seven guns per person in Connecticut and three in Indiana. So these are people who have a lot of guns typically. The average, uh, and, the, and what happens typically if the police go in and they find someone to serve this risk warrant to take the guns away, is they find someone in a crisis. And over half the time, they transport that individual to a hospital emergency department for evaluation. And in Connecticut, the proportion of people actually receiving treatment for a mental health problem in the community doubled from 12% to 24% in the year before to the year after the gun removal action. So sometimes it actually provides a portal into treatment and people getting help. So does it actually save lives? Well, it's hard to tell in terms of you know, mass shootings. We didn't have any homicides. But when we followed up these cases and looked at the death records, we found a very high rate of suicide, 30 to 40 times higher than the general population rate of suicide. I think that's important politically and legally because it shows that the law is not being applied willy-nilly to everybody. It's being applied to a group of people who actually are at high risk of misusing a firearm. So if finding that person, you know, who is going to do this is, is a needle in a haystack, this gives you a much smaller needle with more haystack, a much smaller haystack with more needles in it. Um, and so, you know, wh what we were finally able to do is, is estimate because, you know, very few of these actually used guns, these suicides, they, and none of them happened except for a couple cases within the year when the guns were, were, were removed. They all happened after the person became eligible to get their guns back. And, but they used other methods. And so we were able to calculate, to do this kind of what if. What if the guns had not been removed? How many more people would have died? Because the case fatality rate for using a gun in suicide is incredibly high. And the answer was, for every 10 to 20 of these gun removal actions, one life was saved by averting a suicide, by moving it to, to some other method of suicide that, that is much more survivable. And there's emerging evidence from a number of the new states that have enacted these laws that actually there is, uh, that, that some uh, mass shootings have been thwarted. People have intended to commit a mass shooting and they have been stopped by this process. So that's the kind of the information that we want to put in the hands of lawmakers about what's in the balance of risk and rights. You know, is, is, uh, is this uh, high or low, you know, 10 gun removal uh, actions to save one life? Well, if you care more about the Second Amendment right than anything else, maybe it's unacceptable. But if you're like many people, you know, like me in particular, you have a gun suicide story in your own family, maybe that's an acceptable uh, balance. And this is the policy that works. I'll turn it over to Shannon. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here on an early Monday morning. Um, I want to start off by just picking up on two things that Jeff said, because two of the things that he said really run counter to the narrative about gun violence and opportunities for prevention in this country. And the first thing is with regard to what extreme risk protection order laws do. These laws are really focused on intervening when people are behaving dangerously, when people are making threats about what they're likely to do. This is a behavior-oriented type of intervention. It's not about mental illness. 
And the reason for that is because we know from the research that the best predictors of future violence really are those dangerous behaviors. So the way that these extreme risk laws are set up is to be put in effect when people are acting in ways that suggest that they are going to commit violence or are threatening that they are going to commit violence. Again, either against people, against others, or when it comes to suicidal ideation and harm to themselves. So that's the first point that I just want to emphasize from Jeff's overview. The second point goes to those wonderful maps that he showed you. You know, we have an ongoing dialogue in this country that um, gun policy, gun violence prevention policy is something that we can't do. It's unattainable. But when you look at what's been going on in the states over the past six years, and there's a lot of policy people in the audience, we can all appreciate that six years is not a lot of time um, in the policy world. Over the past six years, 15 states and the district have passed extreme risk protective order bills into law. That's incredible. Change is possible here in this country, and this case example proves just that. So I'd just like you to keep in, that in mind as we talk about the opportunities that exist with regard to extreme risk protection order laws in this country and the recommendations that we have with regard to these laws in particular. So with regard to the opportunities, um, the first thing that I'd like to just emphasize is the importance of implementation and the real need to focus on implementation of these laws. So these laws have come online in very short order. And there's a lot of different ways that states and localities are working to implement them. We at our center, um, with the help from the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence, have been working with states and localities to identify those places where model implementation efforts are occurring. And there's some great work going on out there. Work like in Maryland, where um, we have the sheriffs who have really taken the lead to prior to our law in Maryland going online in October of 2018, making sure that there was solid law enforcement training that was offered to law enforcement statewide. What do we see around the state as a result? We see extreme risk protection order laws being used statewide. We see them being used in a way that's fair and just and consistent across the states. What else do we see? Local jurisdictions like King County, where Seattle is located in Washington state, are doing a tremendous job of bringing together multi-agency teams of law enforcement people to work together to make sure that whether you're in the police department, whether you're in the sheriff's department, whether you're a prosecutor, whether you're a judge, you know what the law is, you know how it works, and extreme risk protection order laws are being issued in a way that's consistent, fair, and in the best interest of community safety. So we've got good models out there with regard to how implementation should work, and we need to really focus on implementation for those states where extreme risk protection order laws exist. And the good news is, is that we've uh, documented and collected a lot of information with regard to some of these model jurisdictions on a website that's shown here on the slide. So if you Google Johns Hopkins, American Health, ERPO implementation, you'll come to our website and you'll see video interviews with the frontline law enforcement people who are making these laws happen, again, in a fair, consistent way that's making a difference for community safety in the places where they're involved. The second thing that I would mention with regard to opportunities is that while we have 17 states in the district where extreme risk protection order laws are in place, there are 33 laws in this country that don't yet have the benefit of these laws. Now, most of those states have actually introduced bills, and they're working their way through conversations in those places. But this is a real opportunity to bring this life-saving policy intervention to places where it doesn't yet exist, to places where there are lots of Uncle Floyds, like what Jeff mentioned, who could benefit from the type of intervention that extreme risk protection order laws give. And the final thing that I'll just mention with regard to opportunities here is the opportunity for research. 
we have these laws that are rolling out all across the country in states like California and Massachusetts and states like Nevada and Hawaii and Florida. You know, this is, an, a, this is a policy intervention that diverse states have really taken up and there's a real opportunity to figure out through research how we can best implement these laws to assure that they have the maximum benefit on the public's health. So given that, what do we have to say with regard to specific recommendations here today? Because we want you to walk away with some very tangible things that can be done in response to the evidence that we have about these laws. So a few things. So first of all, while extreme risk protection order laws are, are really a state level intervention, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there's nothing that we at the federal level can do, because there's lots that, that, that Congress can do. And perhaps the most important thing that Congress can do at this point in time is to really support the state implementation efforts through federal funding. So federal funding can do a number of things to support good implementation at the state level. Federal funding can support training of law enforcement. Law enforcement like um, what I witnessed happen in my home state of Maryland so that law enforcement officers, when they are on scene and identify a case that would benefit from a temporary gun removal, know how to approach the court, know how to serve that order, know how to safely remove those guns. Training's essential, and the federal government can play a good role in assuring that that happens around the country. We also want to point out that federal funding can go a long way toward incentivizing the type of multi-agency collaborations that I described happening in places like uh, King County, Washington. Having the benefit of law enforcement teams, of frontline law enforcement officers working together with prosecutors and judges to assure that everybody who's involved in the um, decisions around extreme risk orders and the service of those orders knows the law and is working together well, again, to assure that these laws are being is issued in a consistent and fair way that will benefit the community safety. There's also a need to make sure that there is education for allied professionals like clinicians, like school administrators, and community leaders in these laws. As Jeff mentioned, it's not only law enforcement that can initiate these petitions, but in most states, the overwhelming majority of these states, family members and intimate partners can also initiate these petitions. So the importance of people understanding when these laws can be used and the processes that are involved is really key. I want to also mention the importance of assuring that the systems that are in place to support the extreme risk um, order infrastructure are working is really very important. So extreme risk protection order laws temporarily prohibit the respondent to those orders from purchasing and possessing guns. So in order for that purchase prohibition to work, we need to make sure that our national instant criminal background check system is up and receiving the people who are prohibited temporarily under these orders. So attention to making sure that once those orders are issued, that they get into the NICS system is really important or else they, those laws aren't going to be effective in prohibiting those gun purchases from happening. And finally, the last important role that the federal government can have in terms of supporting these extreme risk laws is to make sure that researchers are adequately funded and supported to identify best practices for implementation, to identify how best different jurisdictions can implement and enforce these extreme risk order laws, and to assure that the impacts that are being re realized through these laws are being measured and shared with the practitioners involved so that we can inform those implementation efforts going forward. So that's a lot of um, tasks for the federal government to accomplish, but I have every confidence um, that Congress is up to that challenge. At the state level, there's a number of things that the states can do as well. For those 17 states in the district that already have extreme risk protection order laws in place, pay attention to implementation. You've got a wonderful tool at your disposal. Let's make sure that you use them well. 
We here at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, um, Bloomberg School of Public Health, are ready and willing to support implementation efforts. Again, look to our website for guidance with regard to how to implement these laws well. And for those 33 states that don't have extreme risk protection order laws on the books yet, work hard with the stakeholders in your community to get those laws passed, and then work with us to figure out how they can best be implemented. Again, thank you so much for tuning in this morning, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Benjamin to introduce our next panelist. Thank, thank you very, very much. So our next panelist is um, Dr. April Zoli. Dr. Zoli is the Associate Professor at the School of Criminal Justice at the Michigan State University. And she's going to talk about stronger protections for victims of domestic violence. Three point four percent of non fatal intimate partner violence events involve a firearm. Three point four percent may not sound like much, but that amounts to roughly thirty two thousand nine hundred a year in the United States, or just over ninety per day. Guns are used non fatally to threaten, to intimidate, to coerce, to pistol whip, and to shoot at victims of intimate partner violence and sometimes their children or loved ones. We often mostly hear about fatal events that involve guns. And for intimate partner homicide in 2017, about 58% of them were committed with a gun. And that does represent an increasing upward trend of the percentage of intimate partner homicides that involve a gun over the past few years in the United States. And that upward trend in the percentage that involves guns coincides with an upward trend in the number of intimate partner homicides as well. So this is a very concerning trend in the United States. Between 6 and 20 percent of intimate partner homicides involve at least one additional victim. Those victims are most often children of the targeted intimate partner, other family members, sometimes they're police officers. And the majority of intimate partner homicides that involve more than one victim are committed with guns. You may have heard that 53% of mass shootings in this country involve the killing of an intimate partner or family member victim. Now, there are two ways that specify that domestic violence perpetrators are not allowed to have guns. And those are through domestic violence restraining orders that carry firearm restrictions, and also convictions for misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. And let's talk about the domestic violence restraining order, firearm restrictions first. And I'm going to refer to domestic violence restraining orders as DVROs, so I don't have to say that phrase over and over again. DVRO firearm restrictions are incredibly important because they are initiated by the victim. The victim applies for a DVRO. The victim doesn't have to wait for a police report, for prosecuting attorneys to, to decide to charge the batterer. They don't need to wait for a conviction. They just have to petition, and very quickly a judge will make a decision about the petition. They also don't have to wait the amount of time it takes for a case to make its way through the criminal justice system from arrest and charges through to conviction. A DVRO goes into place relatively quickly. So they can be a way for someone who is in crisis, who is in danger right now, to find safety. Four longitudinal ecological level studies of the impact of state level DVRO firearm restriction laws have found that they are associated with decreases in intimate partner homicides committed with firearms and with decreases in total intimate partner homicide. And this is important because we're not just changing the method of death. We're not just decreasing intimate partner homicides with firearms. We're seeing associated reductions with the total number of intimate partner homicides, suggesting that these laws save lives. But there are some variations from state to state in these DVRO firearm restrictions. 
And one of them is whether dating partners can be covered. Under the federal DVRO firearm restriction law, dating partners are not covered. Current and former spouses are covered, those who share a child are covered, and people who live or used to live together are covered. Some states don't have their own state-level DVRO firearm restriction, so they rely on the federal law and don't cover dating partners. Some states have their own DVRO firearm restriction, but still don't cover dating partners. But some have their own law and do cover dating partners, so there's a lot of variation. The next source of variation is whether ex parte or emergency restraining orders are covered. And ex parte orders are those orders that go into place very quickly. Someone petitions for the DVRO, and a judge decides if their case warrants the protection a DVRO would provide right away, before a hearing that the respondent had the opportunity to attend. And some states cover those, but the federal government doesn't and some states don't. The third variation is whether a state requires a judge or allows a judge to require a person who is now prohibited from possessing a gun under a DVRO to relinquish their guns. So this is a, an implementation step. If somebody already possesses a gun and now they're prohibited, they possess the gun illegally now and need to get rid of it in order to not have one to be in the spirit of the law. So I and many of the people in this room, or at least some of the people in this room, did a study last year, and we looked at these three differences in the DVRO firearm restriction laws. And the first one we looked at was coverage of dating partners. And we found that in comparisons to states that didn't have their own DVRO firearm restriction law, so just relied on the federal law, States that covered dating partners under DVRO firearm restrictions had an associated 13% reduction in intimate partner homicide and an associated 16% reduction in intimate partner homicide committed with firearms. And this kind of makes sense because roughly 50% of intimate partner homicides right now are committed by dating partners. We spend a lot more time dating these days than, than we used to. We get married later, divorce is relatively common, so you spend a lot more time exposed to dating partners and they can pose a greater risk. The second thing we look at was the coverage of those ex parte orders. And similar to the finding with dating partners, we found that coverage of ex parte orders was associated with a 13% decrease in intimate partner homicide and a 16% decrease an intimate partner homicide committed with guns. And again, the logic here makes sense. If someone is in danger now, if a judge decides, looking at their petition, that they need the protections a domestic violence restraining order will bring now, waiting 10 days, two weeks, in some places a month for that full hearing so that a firearm restriction can be put on after the full hearing, may leave them exposed to a great amount of risk for a relatively long period of time. So using that period, having firearm restrictions in that period may save lives. Two studies looked at whether those relinquishment provisions were associated with intimate partner homicide, and they found a, tw a 10 to 12 percent reduction in intimate partner homicide and a 14 to 16 percent reduction an intimate partner homicide committed with guns. And again, this is about implementation. You can say that someone is restricted from having a firearm, but if they have one and law enforcement does not remove it for them, from them or they do not relinquish it in some way, then you haven't really safeguarded their victims. Next on to the misdemeanor firearm restrictions. The federal government also has this domestic violence uh, misdemeanor firearm restriction, and two studies that have looked at that have found reductions in intimate partner homicide, about 9 to 10% reduction across states in intimate partner homicide. And the studies that have looked at the state-level restrictions in comparison with states that don't have their own law, so that rely on the federal law, have not found an association 
with intimate partner homicide, again, comparing them with that federal law, which does have an associated reduction. But some states have gone further than that and have said, if you're convicted of a violent misdemeanor crime, it doesn't matter who that victim was. It doesn't matter what your relationship to them was, stranger, wife, dating partner. You are not allowed to have a gun for five, to five years, 10 years, for some amount of time. And states that have done this, that have done away with that relationship requirement, have found a 23% reduction in intimate partner homicide. 23% is really big. So why might we see such a large reduction in intimate partner homicide in association with those laws that are not specific to intimate partner violence? Well, one reason we think is because those people who are committing severe and potentially fatal intimate partner violence don't just specialize in intimate partner violence. They're committing other violent crimes as well. So they may be prohibited already from gun ownership under these violent misdemeanor prohibitions. We may be safeguarding victims that way. The other reason is the way the background check works. If someone is convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor crime, they could be convicted under any number of statutes, assault, uh, you know, battery, it may not be specific in the statute that this is domestic violence and has that required relationship needed in states or the federal government to qualify for the domestic violence misdemeanor um, prohibition. So it could be difficult to identify them in the background check, or at least more difficult to identify them than it is if you're just saying if, you're if you've convicted of a violent crime, you can't have a gun. So if assault shows up, it doesn't matter what the relationship is. The person doing the background check doesn't have to check and find out what the relationship is. They're just prohibited from having a gun. So it may be easier to implement the purchase prohibition. Because implementation is important, and Shannon gave us you know, really a wonderful uh, overview of implementation, and I think these aspects are gonna be echoed quite a bit today. But we need to implement these restrictions. The possession restriction, we have some counties, some places that are really doing a good job with you know, creative planning on how to legally and safely remove guns from those who now possess them illegally. But we need more jurisdictions to get to work on that. Um, the purchase restriction, it requires those disqualifying records to go into the background check system fairly immediately and for it to be obvious that these are disqualifying restrictions so that when a background check is conducted, the person isn't allowed to buy a gun. It also requires a background check to occur. In states where you can buy from a private seller without a background check, the purchase restriction is much harder to enforce because you have that group of people who simply don't have to do one. So my recommendations are that Congress and state legislatures extend domestic violence restraining order firearm restrictions to cover dating partners and to cover those ex parte orders. If we cover this broader group of people, we may be covering more people who are potential intimate partner homicide perpetrators, and even if they're not, people who are potential non-fatal gun use perpetrators. We also need Congress and state legislators to potentially extend firearm restrictions to people convicted of violent misdemeanors and not just domestic violence misdemeanors. Again, the research suggests that this is associated with reductions in intimate partner homicide. And we also have research to suggest that people convicted of violent misdemeanor crimes are likely to commit more violent crimes in the future. So this is a risky group of people that we probably want to remove guns from to safeguard the public. And finally, Congress, state legislatures, implementing organizations, everybody needs to get together on implementation of these restrictions. The relinquishment laws need to be passed in states that don't have them, 
Jurisdictions need to have a written protocols and resources dedicated to implementation. So we do need those resources to go to implementation of the possession restriction. And we also need to work on the purchase restriction. Purchaser licensing laws, which we'll hear more about in just a moment, um, are found to be an effective way to reduce you know, gun violence. Um, and I'll save that for our next speaker. Um, you know, but we also need to remove private sellers' ability to sell without a background check. And if we do that, we may save more lives. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker um, is Dr. Cassandra um, Crisfasi. Um, she is a deputy director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research. She's an assistant professor uh, at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she's going to talk about background checks and firearm purchaser licensing. Hi, welcome. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the background check system, but I want to spend just a few minutes talking about it so that when I talk about licensing, we, we're all sort of on the same page and have some important context. So the uh, federal background check system was established as part of the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, and that's what created this requirement for background checks by licensed dealers. When a purchaser wants to buy a gun from a licensed seller, they go uh, and submit themselves for a background check, and they get run through this instant check system. And it really is instant. The vast majority of background checks come back in about two minutes. And one of three things happen when a purchaser uh, submits themselves for a background check. The seller can be alerted that the sale can proceed immediately, or they can be immediately denied if the pur purchaser is prohibited. But there's a third thing that can happen, and that can be a delay. And perhaps more time is needed to complete that background check to look through some of the records that April had mentioned. And law enforcement has three days to complete that background check. If it doesn't come back in the three days, the default under federal law is that the seller can proceed with that sale even if the purchaser is prohibited. If after those three days and the sale is completed, the background check comes back as prohibited, then law enforcement has to go and take guns away from people who sh never should have gotten them in the first place. A challenge with the federal background check system is that states and, and local law enforcement agencies don't always report prohibiting conditions in a timely manner, and this also applies um, to mental health prohibitions. So this creates gaps where people who are prohibited, maybe their records haven't yet been reported into the federal system, can obtain firearms even if they shouldn't have them. Another issue with the federal system is that it relies on name and birthday checks, which can miss, um, some research has found, as many as 10% of prohibiting conditions. Federal law, as, as we, uh, I'm sure, are all aware, doesn't extend this background check requirement for private sales. It only applies to licensed dealers. Sellers aren't allowed to sell to someone that they know is prohibited, but if sellers don't ask and buyers don't tell, then there's really no way to know that that person is prohibited without conducting a background check. Recognizing this gap, 21 states and the District of Columbia have extended background checks um, for private sales uh, of, of guns. The other policy that I want to talk to you about is firearm purchaser licensing. So these laws require that anyone who wants to buy a gun apply to state or local law enforcement to get a license. As part of the process, applicants often get their photograph taken. They usually submit fingerprints, at least um, on that first application. And the use of fingerprints increases the likelihood that someone will be properly identified and screened out from purchasing a firearm if they're prohibited. In fact, Fingerprinting is required for most occupational licensing because of the, the higher quality of a background check and ability to identify those records. Law enforcement has, on average, 30 days to complete that background check, giving them more time to 
better identify records and again, screen out those people who uh, have those dangerous conditions and we've agreed that they shouldn't have firearms. That additional time is really key to make sure that we're not missing records. So if you think back to the Charleston church shooting, the inability to complete that background check in three days is what facilitated that individual obtaining that firearm and committing that shooting. That extra time also can delay impulsive acquisition. So if someone is thinking about acquiring a firearm to harm self or others, that delay in time um, to get the license processed can uh, delay that impulsive acquisition. Importantly, people who want to buy guns in states with licensing have to show their license to every seller, regardless of whether they're licensed or not. Uh, and this is really important for increasing accountability. If I'm in a state with licensing and I sell to someone without a license and that gun is then recovered in crime, it's a lot easier to prove that I violated the law because that person didn't have a license and was an ineligible purchaser. So there's some variation across the states that have licensing laws. Uh, there are nine that require a license for all handgun purchasers. Some also require um, uh, safety training. Um, some give discretion to law enforcement, and some of the, the permits last or licenses last for different durations. But the core components are an application to law enforcement and more time to conduct a thorough background check. So what do we know about these policies? So requiring background checks for private sales is associated with lower rates of guns being brought illegally across state lines. So meaning that if a state has a background check law for private sales, um, it's less likely that those guns are gonna end up in crime in another state. And background checks are a really important foundation for other policies to work. We heard about the, the importance of background checks for domestic violence prohibitions. Uh, if, you have, if a state has other prohibitions, like Florida has a minimum age law, if you don't require background checks for private sales, you create an avenue where people can avoid undergoing a background check and get around those prohibiting conditions. However, while background checks are a really important foundation and they're necessary as a robust part of a functioning background, a functioning policy set for uh, identifying prohibited individuals, they haven't yet been enough on their own to reduce gun violence. And that's uh, unless they're paired with this licensing system. Uh, this is really due in large part to issues with records reporting and, uh, and enforcement. <coughs> it's uncommon for people who violate a background check law to be held accountable for that action. This gap is really creating harms to the public's health and contributing to our burden of gun violence in this country. A primary focus really needs to be on, focus, uh, on um, strengthening this system. We need to have better reporting of records, timely reporting. Uh, we need to have all purchasers, regardless of from whom they're buying the gun, undergoing a background check. And then we could further strengthen this system by pairing it with a licensing law. So in, uh, what we know about uh, firearm purchaser licensing laws is that they're very, very good for public safety. These laws are associated with fewer crime guns being traced to within state sales. So often, um, individuals who are committing crimes in states with licensing get those guns from states with weaker laws. This means that the local source of crime guns are restricted. And it's harder to get a gun within your state. You have to go across state lines. We hear a lot about you know, gun laws don't work. Look at um, Illinois, look at Chicago. They have high rates of gun violence. And so obviously, these laws aren't working. But of the crime guns, there are about 10,000 crime guns recovered in Illinois last year. About half of them came from sales that originated in Illinois, about half, which is average for a state that has licensing. Of the guns that didn't come from Illinois, most of them came from Indiana, which doesn't have background checks. They don't have licensing laws. So even when a state has strong gun laws, they're at the mercy of states around them that have weaker laws. And in contrast to what we found for background checks, the research on licensing 
is really strong, and it shows, again, these, these public safety benefits. Connecticut passed a purchaser licensing law in 1995. They had an in-person application and fingerprinting, and they saw a 40% reduction in firearm suicide and a 15% reduction in firearm suicide in the first 10 years that the law was in place. Missouri repealed a similar law in 2007. They had required an in-person application and had a permit that was good for 30 days. They had a 27, uh, 17 to 27% increase in firearm homicide and a 16% increase in firearm suicide. Additionally, because this, the repeal of this law freed up their uh, sort of local sources of guns, they saw a, a dramatic increase in in-state crime gun recoveries. In 2006, about 50% of their guns originated in Missouri. And as of 20, 2018, it was almost 80%. In large urban counties where firearm homicide tends to concentrate, these large urban counties that ha uh, were in states with licensing had 11% lower rates of firearm homicide. And in the context of mass shootings, that's a, a common um, outcome that we talk about. And while it's exceedingly rare, it, it tends to drive the policy conversation. Uh, we have some new research that's forthcoming that found that um, purchaser licensing laws that had an in-person application and fingerprinting uh, reduced the incidence of, fire, of mass shootings by 56% and reduced the victims in these incidents by 57%. Because, again, the process of applying for and obtaining this license can uh, delay impulsive um, acquisition that can reduce the likelihood that someone can obtain that firearm to harm themselves or others. Background checks enjoy really broad public support. Consistently, they're supported by over 85% of U.S. adults with very little difference between gun owners and non-gun owners or across the political spectrum. While purchaser licensing laws don't have quite that same level of support, still 75% of U.S. adults support licensing. That includes more than 60% of gun owners who support being required to apply to state or local law enforcement before they can buy a gun. And when you look at gun owners who live in states that already have a licensing law, that support is over 75%. Among African-American uh, individuals who live in metropolitan areas, those who are among um, experiencing the greatest burden of gun violence, their support for licensing is 80%. So we often hear that gun laws are uh, in violation of the Second Amendment and that licensing is going to create this big onerous burden and prevent people from exercising their Second Amendment rights. If that were true, we would expect to see lower levels of support among gun owners who have gone through the process of obtaining a license. But in fact, we see um, quite high levels of support for this evidence-based policy. So I'm going to uh, wrap up with some recommendations. Congress uh, needs to pass legislation requiring background checks for all gun sales. Individuals should not have an opportunity to buy a gun from a private seller without being subjected to a background check. And unless we close this policy gap, we're going to continue to experience harms to our public's health. Congress should also explore the feasibility of establishing a federal licensing system um, to make sure that all gun owners are thoroughly vetted before buying a gun. In the absence of a federal system, states should complement their background check requirements with a licensing law that includes fingerprinting and in-person application and safety training. A really important piece of any policies functioning is accountability. Are you enforcing it? We've heard about implementation from other speakers. So state and federal law enforcement agencies need to be holding individuals accountable when they violate the law. People who lie and try, people who engage in straw purchase or otherwise make guns available for use in crime need to be held accountable so that we encourage responsible behaviors. And finally, Congress needs to provide incentives to states um, so that they can support their activities, whether it's policy or some of the community level interventions that we're going to hear about in the second panel. There needs to be resources uh, dedicated to reducing the burden of gun violence through both policy and programs. Thank you.
And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Daniel Webster. Um, Dr. Webster is the director of the John Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research um, and a Bloomberg professor of the American Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dan. Hi, good morning. Um, the policy I'm going to discuss today uh, addresses assault weapons and uh, large capacity magazines that I'll define in just a moment. Um, not surprising, the, the reason that this is part of this panel, why we're having this discussion, is that these are the type of weapons that are most commonly used in the most high profile uh, public mass shootings. Um, there's no category of gun deaths that is rising as rapidly as are those types of shootings, the public mass shootings. And invariably, the, uh, those events with the highest casualty counts involve the use of an assault-style rifle and uh, large-capacity magazines. So let me, let me define uh, that uh, very specifically. Well, large-capacity magazines are relatively straightforward to define, at least in terms of policy. Most uh, state policies that ban uh, I'll, I'll use the term LCMs for short, uh, define that as more than 10 rounds uh, of ammunition in the uh, ammunition feeding device or magazine. Assault weapons um, are defined as semi-automatic firearms that are able to accept these large capacity magazines and typically have one or more other features that are commonly uh, associated or, or, or more designed for military or criminal purposes. These may include pistol grips, folding stocks, barrel shrouds, other types of, uh, of characteristics that sort of facilitate a large, uh, a very rapid fire of, uh, of the gun in a very short period of time. Um, so the policies uh, in, in question have uh, banned the sale um, and manufacture of these um, uh, firearms. And in, uh, for the period 1994 to 2004, we had a federal ban of assault-style weapons and LCMs. Several states also regulate or, or ban um, these uh, types of weapons. Uh, seven states and the District of Columbia um, have, I'm not advancing my slides, I apologize, um, ban um, uh, assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Uh, and two states, um, Colorado and Vermont, just uh, restrict large capacity magazines. Now, in some of these instances, they also address pre-banned or the grandfathered types of, of guns. Um, the District of Columbia prohibits uh, assault weapons altogether. Two states limit where you can have them and, and require licensing of those firearms. What do we know first about the use of these types of weapons in crime? Well, shockingly, um, none of our systems truly uh, track the use of these types of firearms in violent crime in the United States. What we have to go on is the um, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms gun trace data. We know that 5% um, of guns traced to crime uh, recovered by law enforcement are categorized as assault weapons. If you look at the weapons used in uh, instances when law enforcement officers are shot and killed in the line of duty, those represent 13% of, uh, of those cases have assault weapons. And um, the, the other estimates, and, and much of this research I should acknowledge, Christopher Coper, uh, who's done some of the uh, landmark research uh, on the use of these weapons in crime, uh, find that they're used um, in uh, anywhere from 10 to 36% of fatal mass shootings. Now, what about large capacity magazines? Again, the only thing we have to go on now is uh, the f handful of cities that uh, track such uh, things, and from those cities we see 22 to 36 percent of firearms recovered uh, by law enforcement involve a, a large capacity magazine. And if you look at their use in fatal mass shootings, um, large capacity magazines have, um, uh, involved in um, 20 to 67 percent 
of these uh, fatal mass shootings. And, and the reason for these ranges is in this study is defined uh, based on the, the victim count or the circumstances, how restrictive they are in their studies. Now, Dr. Coper has a paper coming out that um, compares the uh, fatalities and, and injuries in instances of fatal mass shootings with and without these types of weapons. What he finds is that um, fatal mass shootings with LCMs have uh, 60 to 67 percent higher fatality counts and about two to three times the number of non-fatal wounding uh, accounts in fatal mass shootings. In a study that uh, looked at uh, what we call active shooter scenarios, these are cases in which people come into a crowd of people to, to try to um, shoot uh, large numbers of people, um, and used a number, looked at a number of factors that may play into the casualty counts. Uh, in that research, they estimate that um, having a large capacity magazine roughly doubled um, the, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, it's, it was a semi-automatic gun, usually assault-style rifle with an LCM that doubled fatality counts and increased non-fatal woundings 81%. Now, there have been a very limited number of studies that have des been designed to look at very specific gun laws and their association with fatal mass shootings. And, and I should say that Dr. Coper also looked at the federal assault weapons ban and found no association with overall rates of, of violent crime, uh, which should not be surprising since uh, really the issue is principally in fatal mass shootings. Um, but these studies, have, have had mixed results and have a variety of limitations. One study um, just looked at FBI data and, and um, focused exclusively on the federal um, and state assault weapons bans, but not other uh, types of gun laws, and found no evidence of protective effects. Another study, uh, conversely, published earlier this year, uh, looked at fatal mass shootings and found the opposite conclusion, estimate that as many as 70% reduction might be attributable to the federal assault weapons ban. This also had important limitations on their uh, data that they used and, and definitions of, basically they excluded um, a very large number of fatal mass shootings in this study. And yet another study also um, uh, published in 2015 looked exclusively, again, only at assault weapon bans and did not look at other state laws. That estimate, uh, the estimate from that study suggested a protective effect. So you have mixed uh, findings um, across these studies, but they have very important limitations. That motivated our team at uh, Johns Hopkins to uh, do a new study looking at the association between these firearm policies and uh, fatal mass shootings. And I'll summarize our findings here. Um, so first of all, we identified over 600 um, fatal mass shootings from 1985 to 2017. Um, interestingly, we identified some of the m biggest mass shootings that have uh, driven policy discussions were actually excluded from the FBI system. That's a separate discussion. Um, what we found, uh, and, and what we do, we comprehensive look at a number of state laws and a number of, of uh, covariates that are, are associated or, or theoretically connected to fatal mass shootings in our study. We found no association between, uh, no statistically significant association between the federal assault weapon ban and this outcome, nor did we find a statistically significant effect for state bans of assault weapons. Now the point estimate did suggest a 29% uh, lower rate associated with um, those state bans of assault weapons, but not statistically significant. We think a, a reason that we're not seeing this impact from the federal and state laws is that there are many different uh, alternatives and uh, if, uh, if these types of weapons are banned for grandfathered guns, for guns coming from other states, and other ways to basically get around uh, these, these laws. But we found very different and encouraging effects when we looked at restrictions on large capacity magazines. Um, our estimate was that uh, these laws that uh, ban large capacity magazines are associated with a 49% lower rate of fatal mass shootings. 
And if you look at the, uh, this on a per capita basis, number of fatalities from fatal mass shootings, we see a 70% lower rate of um, individuals killed in these shootings associated with bans of large capacity magazines. Now, we looked at a number of different uh, ways to sort of look at the sensitivity of our findings to different um, model uh, assumptions and different, uh, we even did some studies where we excluded certain uh, mass shootings uh, like the Aurora shooting in Colorado and Newtown that soon afterwards led to a large capacity magazine restriction and, and we sort of set those observations aside to see if uh, our results uh, were consistent, and largely they were. The one exception is if you assume that these laws have a gradual impact rather than a more immediate impact, our estimates are lower uh, um, but and not statistically significant. So um, most of our tests are, are highly robust to a variety of model assumptions. So this leads to um, what I think are some clear policy recommendations relevant to these questions um, that are so important to fatal mass shootings. I think very clearly uh, the evidence indicates that we should uh, ban both the sale and possession of large capacity magazines, that this will reduce the number of fatalities quite substantially. Um, we might consider to ha having uh, stiff penalties for possession of these firearms if we want to take this seriously. And um, think carefully about ways that we um, recover or, or encourage people to get rid of any large capacity magazine that they might possess when a ban goes into effect. The more uh, challenging question really is, what do we do about assault uh, weapons. Um, I believe the available evidence right now suggests that, yes, they are uh, very clearly highly involved in these fatal mass shootings. I would say there's not a justifiable reason for civilians to have um, military-style weapons like assault weapons, but right now we're not seeing the, the policy solutions that are being proposed are not having the effect. I, uh, I believe that a very prudent uh, policy recommendation would be that we need to highly regulate these types of firearms, require licensing, as Dr. Kafasi told us, the many benefits of, of that. And I should say that um, the other policy most strongly associated with reductions in fatal mass shootings was licensing for firearm purchasers. Um, uh, I believe a 44% re statistically significant reduction associated uh, for fatal mass shootings connected to purchaser licensing. So we need to tightly regulate and restrict these types of firearms that are already available that are very challenging to address um, uh, in, a, in a practical way of how you restrict that type of firearm given how many that we already have. So that concludes my uh, presentation. So we're going to go on um, and have um, Q and A, and just um, I'll take my seat back, and we can we can do that from that. We'll certainly have um, some mics in the the room um, up here. I think on the right um, for people who are in the room who want to ask a question. And I know that we hopefully will have some questions that are coming in um, from the um, from our social media uh, feed. Um, with that, let me just start the, the first question just to get things rolling. Um, you know, for me, as, as I as I listen to the various policies, um, it, in many ways, it seems like um, helping to identify people who are at at, at risk um, is the core of what we're talking about and then using a variety of tools to decide who and who should not um, uh, have a firearm for a variety of periods. Some people should never have one, uh, and certainly some people should have it removed because for some period of time they're at risk. Um, uh, Dr. Kosasi, could you talk a little bit more about licensing and how, um, again, just reiterate some of that, um, that, that important work, and then if, I, if you could follow that with Dr. Zioli, 
talking about that in the context uh, of domestic violence again. Is this, can you hear me? Good, oh, I can hear myself now, okay. Um, yeah, so one, one of the really important elements of a licensing system is that state and local law enforcement are conducting a background check in addition to federal law. So they have access to state records, local records for criminal prohibitions, but also mental health records that haven't yet perhaps been reported into the federal system. And so you have sort of a multi-layered approach to the background check system and that interaction with law enforcement, sort of going in, submitting fingerprints, having that conversation can change your relationship to purchasing that firearm. It's not the same thing as walking up to a garage sale or a pawn shop or even going to a licensed dealer and just having the individual who is interested in selling you the firearm conducting the background check. So adding that extra layer of accountability, more records, more time, sort of better identify and screen out those people who have a risky condition or risky behaviors that you know we've decided they shouldn't own firearms. And you know, to bring it to, no. am I? Yeah, you're you're okay. And, and to bring it to you know, domestic violence perpetrators, um, it is incredibly important that those records get into the background check system. There is an incredibly and unfortunately you know, famous case of a shooter who had been convicted of domestic violence through the military, but the military didn't put those records into the background check system. And so he committed a mass shooting at a small church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. So just restricting somebody isn't enough. We, we need to actually make sure through that purchase restriction and purchaser licensing laws and through removing guns from those who already have them that they don't have access to guns. If we don't work on implementation, then it's just words on a piece of paper. Let me, let me ask um, uh, Shannon and Jeff if you pipe in on that same point. Well, I would just say, in, you know, apropos of the risk-based approach, that this that uh, that is true. It's also it's challenging. Uh, you know, there are other countries that take a different approach and say, well, <coughs> broadly limit legal access to guns, and the default is people don't have access to guns, and then on the margins, uh, they make exceptions. And in our country, it's kind of the opposite because of the way our Supreme Court has interpreted the Second Amendment to the Constitution. So the default is people have this right, and we're talking about risk. We're, we're actually talking about trying to identify people who pose such a high risk or category of uh, individuals who pose a risk that it's justified to limit that person's Second Amendment right. And that's very difficult to do scientifically because uh, the, the uh, risk factors for violent behavior and, and uh, misusing firearms are many, and they often are nonspecific. They tend to apply to many more people who aren't going to do the thing you're trying to prevent. So that's, that's why we, I think, need uh, the kind of research that we're doing um, to bring to bear to those policy decisions to help strike this balance of, of risk uh, and rights. And, uh, you know, because, um, w and, the, and, the, and the evidence base needs to be uh, developed as we go along and having this conversation between evidence-based policy and policy-informed research. So we as researchers are actually doing studies that matter. If we get the answer to that question, it's going to help us uh, to enact a policy that will save lives. Yeah, and I would say that one of the most exciting things about extreme risk protection orders from my perspective is it gives us an opportunity to go further back in the trajectory of violence, right? So we don't need to wait for someone to be convicted of a crime in order for them to be ineligible to purchase or possess a firearm. We can look to our communities. We can look to family members, intimate partners, law enforcement, who are oftentimes on the front lines of seeing crises unfold to say, you know what, this isn't a good time for this person to be owning, possessing a gun. Let's go to the court. Let's talk about what this crisis looks like from the perspective of a loved one and assess whether it's a good time to temporarily step in and remove that person's ability to purchase and possess firearms. 
So what we're doing with these sets of policies is moving from you know, the licensing and registration, which really looks at an important indicator of risk with past criminal behavior, past criminal convictions. We're looking at domestic violence behavior, which is incredibly predictive of future violence, and thinking about ways to intervene through those behaviors. And then with extreme risk orders, we're looking at what family members and law enforcement, again, the people who are on the front lines of seeing these trajectories begin, have the authority to go to the court and with a due process uh, system in place, really make the case for why someone should be temporarily prohibited from purchasing and possessing guns based on dangerous behaviors. So we're getting more and more comprehensive with regard to how to, as Jeff likes to say, um, you know, identify the many needles in a small haystack as opposed to where we were maybe five, 10 years ago and where we really didn't have a lot of those good risk factors at our disposal or the tools to act once we identify those risk factors. So I think it's an exciting time in our country with regard to where the evidence has taken us and the opportunities for good policy. You know, one of the interesting things, of course, is that we've had all these, these tragic you know, mass shootings that have gotten the nation's attention. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the interesting things to me, and I think I hear that from every one of your presentations, um, when you do the look back, you always find, oh, we miss this, or we miss that. And I know, Jeff, you don't like the term red flag laws, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, for us more colorful people like me, um, you know, there was something we missed. And um, I think what I'm hearing is that we're learning a lot more about what those opportunities are and how we can, we can narrow in on what those risks are, mm -hmm. identify them, raise them to visibility and then act on them. But it does require an infrastructure and a knowledgeable public and system to do that. Would you all agree on that? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Daniel, you you know, you your um your your issues around um um assault weapons. Um in the back room we were talking about the challenges of actually identifying an assault weapon and the whole process of people's ability to buy them and how they buy them in sections. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Because you didn't bring it up in your, in your talk. Well, um, one way to get around some of these restrictions, um, I, I should be clear again that uh, the way assault weapons tend to be defined is based upon a set of characteristics. Um, and what, what actually is uh, the heart of our regulatory process is the sort of the guts of the firing mechanisms for the firearms. But you can now uh, acquire these different um, components to make yourself an assault weapon, buying those parts separately now. Um, and the manufacturers know that very well. The manufacturers have, have really, frankly, uh, created a different environment uh, to get around uh, the type of restrictions that we've had on assault weapons. So um, I believe that is why we see the pattern of the findings that we see so clearly, that uh, the, the bans that are based upon those characteristics uh, have not had measurable impacts. I'm not saying they have none, but it's hard to identify it statistically. And But the thing that you cannot sort of get around uh, is, uh, is the capacity of, of the uh, ammunition feeding device or magazine. So, uh, and that is, I, I think anybody who studies uh, mass shootings and, and the role of firearms will say that its ammo capacity is really the most critical feature here. Mm -hmm. So unless you want to try to create an environment in which there are no semi-automatic firearms, which I don't think that's going to happen, uh, the very logical uh, and, and most impactful way we can address this is by restricting the uh, ammunition in, in a given um, fe ammunition feeding device. Interesting. Interesting. So the guts is, uh, is, is the number of bullets. Yes, absolutely. There's a question over here. Good morning. We've had some great questions coming in on Twitter. The first is, we, they've talked about all these great policies that are working but why aren't they being placed um, in, to affect everywhere? What's standing in our way? 
Daniel. Okay. Um, has a lot to do with uh, the very powerful gun lobby. Um, and, and they have been a dominant presence in, um, in making policy at the federal level, certainly, and in many states as well. Um, and what's most troubling really is that uh, we've compiled incredible amount of public opinion data. Um, we like to say that gun, gun control or gun policy is a highly controversial topic. The truth of the matter is that the most important policies that we're talking about, universal background checks, licensing, um, a lot of regulations over dealers, the domestic violence restrictions, the extreme risk protection order laws, all of them have incredibly high public support in both parties in terms of, of when you talk to the people. So I think the reason that we don't have this is, is, is purely a political problem, uh, a structural problem that has to do um, in part with the, the great deal of influence that single issue lobby groups can have. Um, but uh, just on, on a hopeful note is I, I truly think that that is changing. For, I, I've been studying this area for almost 30 years, roughly 30 years, and um, we've never been in a time with such strong grassroots support for addressing these weaknesses in our gun policy. So um, I do think, and, and we, we're certainly seeing in extreme risk protection order laws, domestic violence laws as well, a lot of, a lot of policies uh, are being enacted. So I, I'm... I'm optimistic. Right. Yes. Yeah, I, I would also add, uh, I totally agree with, with Daniel's points, but for the last few years, mass shootings have really dominated the policy conversation. When a mass shooting happens, that's when people want to talk about policy solutions, particularly at the federal level. And until very recently, we haven't had the policy prescriptions to talk about how to prevent mass shootings. We have, you know, policies that we know are effective for suicide and homicide and diversions of guns for use in crime. But now with, with ERPOs and the you know, uh, emerging evidence we have on licensing related to mass shootings and domestic violence, the role of that in mass shootings, we're able to, when a mass shooting occurs, pivot to the larger burden of gun violence with these effective policy solutions. And I hope, given the broad public support and the effectiveness of these policies, that we can really start to see more movement forward. Mm -hmm. Another question from the net. Yes. <clears throat> Our next question is, what communications or advocacy strategies do you recommend to help legislators, Republicans in particular, credibly counter their stakeholders' argument that the Second Amendment prevents popular firearm safety policies? So the, the excuse is the Second Amendment's in our way. <laughs> I, I, rem I remember when that, when that um, Scalia, you know, yeah. talked about that. He was real clear that um, there were limits to, uh, to the Second Amendment. Um. You're actually uh, right, Dr. Benjamin, I, and, and sort of who, who will be credible to uh, the Republican constituents? Well, Anthony Scalia. So I would quote directly from uh, Judge Scalia to say that um, actually the Second Amendment allows a great deal of regulation as, as uh, courts have interpreted it to date. Um, and that many of the policy prescriptions we're talking about uh, really do, do, do not disarm law-abiding people. The, the whole Second Amendment issue, really the core of that is, are you going to take my gun away? And the policies and the evidence that we have available right now indicate that you can do that um, in a very narrow, legally defensible way that does not affect uh, law-abiding citizens. So I, I think those are really the talking points, is uh, look to Judge Scalia to tell you about the Second Amendment, not the NRA, and um, that the policy prescriptions that really work do not disarm law-abiding citizens. Thank you. Did you want to? Uh, I just wanted to uh, add, I agree with that 100%. With respect to risk protection order laws, I think there's also a way of talking about them in a way that um, people on both sides of the debate about gun rights and gun, uh, gun control 
can, um, can agree with. I mean, for example, you could say, uh, and I think many gun owners would agree, that, uh, that risk protection order laws are, do not represent an expansion of gun control. They don't affect law-abiding gun owners. And you could even say that if you think that uh, it's people and not guns who are responsible for gun violence, this is a really effective tool to help you identify who those people are. And I think it does give a common place to stand. Uh, you know, if we start with this question, well, should someone who is at manifestly high risk of harming someone else or themselves at that time, should they have legal access to a gun? Overwhelmingly, people across the political spectrum, gun owners, non-gun owners, aren't going to agree with that. And then you could say, okay, well, let's start here. And maybe that's a, that's a, a place to build from. Yeah, and if I, if I may? Please. Yeah, I would just, to add to that, um, you know, we're at a point, unfortunately, in our country where it's not hard for um, anyone, be you a policymaker or um, a scientist or an advocate, to have a personal experience um, with a, a gun tragedy in your family. Um, and it's certainly not hard to, um, for people to sort of call up a personal experience when a loved one was in crisis and to imagine that uh, during that crisis, it's a, it's a particularly bad time to have access to a gun. So in conversations with policymakers, with other stakeholders around extreme risk laws with regard to domestic violence laws, um, we've had great success in terms of that communication strategy with personalizing the issue. Because again, unfortunately, um, we all experience loved ones who go through crises and are, are at points in time in their lives when it's just simply not a good idea to have ready access to lethal means. You know, we, we, it's funny, we do this with every, everything else. Um, you know, we have a, a member, family member in crisis. We go in the house and we take away the pills, we take away the knives. <laughs> um, if we got kids coming over, we lock up cabinets. What, why shouldn't we do this with firearms as well? It's, it's really a, a, a safety issue for more than anything else. Um, what about, what about the, the role of law enforcement? Um, obviously, law enforcement um, um, certainly generally supports most of these kinds of things. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, I'll sure. just say one thing, about, again, about the risk protection order laws as a context. I think that we have found in many conversations with law enforcement um, that they see this as an important tool. Um, you know, to be in a situation where uh, there's knowledge that someone poses a risk and not to be able to act until something happens uh, puts law enforcement in a, in a, in a bad uh, place. And so I think even if they might differ on, uh, you know, larger issues with respect to guns, um, we have found uh, law enforcement um, are very much in favor, particularly, you know, when you think about the implementation context, once they um, have experience with using this tool and um, have kind of worked out some of the kinks of how you do it and how the guns are stored and so on. Um, and I also think it's very important with regard to enacting these laws in the states that haven't done so to have strong support from law enforcement. And I think this has been the case in almost all of the states where they've been enacted, is they have been a, a strong voice uh, at the table advocating for these laws. Um, and so, I mean, that's an answer from you know, one context. I think if the focus is really on the problem, how we understand it, the people, the stories, the people affected, and the logic that this solution has in terms of how it connects to the problem, that's where you get lots of lot of support. When the context moves over into uh, the politics of winning and losing, um, that's when you run into trouble because then you then it becomes much more adversarial. And even people who might support it in the context of thinking, hey, this makes sense, once it's over. In, and, and so I think try not to shift into this you know, political space of who's winning and who's losing, but rather this is something that could save lives. And I think these are policies that can work together to save even more lives than, than one individually. Dr. Sullivan? Uh, and you know, in, in terms of law enforcement and domestic violence, it's fairly well known that domestic violence calls are some of the most dangerous calls that law enforcement will go out on. 
Uh, they have, you know, compared to other types of calls, a very high rate of being shot and killed on domestic violence calls. So they are also in favor of removing guns from domestic violence abusers, not only for intimate partner safety, the children in the household safety, but their own safety and the safety of their colleagues. And they have a great role to play in implementation of you know, those laws as well in terms of cataloging you know, which abusers have guns so that when it comes time for relinquishment, if the person is prohibited from having a gun, they have a record of you know, who they need to go to, who they need to remove a gun from legally and safely. And, and in the context, again, of, of officer safety, licensing has been associated with reductions in officers being shot in the line of duty. So there's some um, occupational safety benefits as well. Yes. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, um, you know, we're here with the American Public Health Association, and I've had many conversations like Jeff uh, with law enforcement around extreme risk protection order laws, and it, 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 quite frankly, as a public health person, it warms my heart to hear them get excited about pre um, prevention for the first time in their career. So we've set up law enforcement in a very difficult situation in which the tools that they have, by and large, are reactive. Um, with extreme risk protection order laws, what we're giving them is an opportunity to get ahead of the tragedy. And they recognize that immediately. And it's very exciting, I think, from a 30,000 foot perspective to think about having law enforcement as a new partner in prevention in a way that previously we haven't had. And quite frankly, at a time in our country when we need law enforcement to be thinking about um, their roles in community in a different way. Absolutely. Another question in the room over here. Hi, I was, uh, my name is Eugenio Weigand from the Center for American Progress. My question is if you have uh, explore licensing and perhaps the assault weapons on the level of gun robberies across the state uh, here in the United States. And in terms of the assault weapons, I have uh, two additional questions. One is uh, pertaining to the international trafficking as well, if like assault weapons there has a m very important role to play that we might consider uh, uh, to advocate for that particular law. And if you are, one of, when you say regulate assault weapons, you mean regulate them as we do automatic weapons right now, or what, what if you could be more specific sure. on that. Um, do you want to first talk about the robbery? The robbery issue first. Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, the vast majority of states don't require gun owners to report when a gun is stolen. And so sort of getting really good data right. on robberies can be challenging. Um, I, don't, I know that some uh, researchers at Harvard have sort of done national surveys and they've asked folks who, who have um, had guns stolen, et cetera. I don't know that anyone has looked at Sort of the licensing of gun purchasers and the association with stolen guns, but we do know that licensing is associated with fewer guns being diverted into crime, and so sort of logically it could potentially contribute to some reductions in, in gun theft. Um, so excellent questions uh, relevant to assault weapons. Um, clearly assault weapons uh, play a very important role in uh, not only in mass shootings in our own country, they're actually having a very detrimental effect in, uh, in Mexico, in Central America, and other uh, countries. Uh, guns that are made and, and initially purchased in the United States because of our weak laws are able to be trafficked to these other countries to cause enormous amount of harm. So we should definitely recognize that. Uh, the, the other re reference, uh, I think, had to do with um, regulating assault style weapons in a way that we currently regulate um, fully automatic firearms. Uh, ba uh, dating back to the 1930s, uh, there's a law that um, basically heavily, heavily regulates and, and restricts um, uh, fully automatic weapons. And that would be a tool that we could consider certainly to address semi-automatic weapons as well. So I think, uh, in essence, the policy choice before us that I think makes sense is either, um, you know, not focus on the way we've banned them before because they're so easily get around them, but have stronger ways to to regulate and restrict that 
that require licensing, registration, taxes, those types of things. So uh, that certainly is, is a direction for consideration as well. Okay. Let me, let me um, you know, every time we have one of these tragedies, that hits the news. Because as you know, these tragedies are occurring each and every day um, in the nation. Um, but the ones, when they hit the news, um, we all run to the, um, to the mental health court and say, boy, if we simply strengthen mental health services in this country, um, you know, we will solve the firearm problem. Now, let, let's just recognize the fact that we have people with mental illness holding up beds in the hospital emergency departments, um, sleeping on the streets of our cities, um, tragically losing everything that they have, and we have not yet invested in mental health for those problems at all. But as soon as there's a shooting, we, we run to, to at least ex express a desire to do that, and then, of course, we don't. Um, can we talk about the, the role of um, both mental illness as a um, contributor to violence, um, and then let's talk about the benefit um, for those people who are mentally ill, since 60% of uh, suicides certainly occur with, um, with guns. Well, I'll take a crack at that. Uh, that's a, um, something I've thought about quite uh, for a long time, and, and I think what happens is that when uh, there's a mass shooting, that's when we start paying attention to what actually is, is not just one, but two different uh, public health problems that sort of intersect on their edges. The idea that uh, this is all about mental health, if we could somehow fix the mental health system, that will reduce uh, mass shootings or gun violence in general, is in part, uh, I think, a dodge to not focus on issues regarding the role of guns in shootings and in violence. In part, it's... Um, it's kind of a um, um, scapegoating mechanism because a mass shooting is so troubling, it's so irrational, it's so scary. We want a, a solution or an answer. Why this happen? And mental illness is a is a is an easy uh, out, and it resonates with what lots of people already believe that that, that mentally ill people are dangerous. Uh, but when we bring science to that uh, narrative, um, we have to debunk it in one big way, which is that the overwhelming majority of people with serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and major depression are not violent towards other people and never will be. And uh, the majority of, of gun crimes are, are, are committed by people who don't have one of those mental illnesses. Now, you know, with regard to mass shootings, it, it's easy to say, well, someone has to have been crazy to do that. That's not the act of a healthy mind. What we actually know from the research that we've done is uh, that and that it's kind of hard to tell, but the majority of mass shooters do not have one of these major kinds of psychiatric disorders, and in particular, the increase that we've seen in recent years uh, tends to be in the category of people who don't have one of those mental illnesses. They're following some kind of a very deviant cultural script and, and are, are very aggrieved uh, young men who have uh, access to this incredibly uh, efficient uh, technology to take a lot of lives. So there certainly is a problem with uh, untreated mental illness in our country. The mental health system we have is fragmented, it's overburdened, it's under-resourced, and it doesn't work very well for lots of people. Tens of millions of people have mental illnesses in this country. And we do need to reform that system and invest in it. But that's a, a solution to a different problem. And uh, I think conflating those two, it's very important to, to separate those issues now, suicide, of course, is responsible for the two-thirds of the gun deaths, and mental illness is a strong vector in, in suicide. So th that, I think, suggests that we should have a conversation about mental illness and, uh, and, and firearm injury and mortality in the context of suicide, suicide. And I think that's where a lot of people can come together who otherwise might be in different camps, because it's very stigmatizing to only talk about mental illness after a mass shooting. Another question? From the um, web. Is this on? No. Is it? Yeah. We can hear you. This, from, this is from one of our live stream viewers. A piece in the LA Times noted that an overwhelming majority of mass shooters have very high ACE scores, ACE. This is much more complex than an issue of mental illness. In terms of policy, what can be done? 
Can, can we um, describe the, the ACE scoring system? It, it's an adverse childhood uh, trauma uh, and injury, and certainly we, we know for sure that um, early in life, many children experience a range of both um, physical, emotional, psychological traumas that ultimately result in a range of behaviors that um, cause them to have troubles in school, um, have short attention spans, can be more aggressive, um, but they don't produce uh, as well and, uh, in society. And you know, some of them have been exposed to um, uh, alcohol in utero, a whole range of, of things. But uh, one of the, 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 the thoughts, of course, is that some of these folks are more prone to um, be more violent as they get older. Well, um, I'll just say that, um, yes, those early uh, traumas and, and challenges that individuals face often very early in their lives, there's tons of research showing that uh, that elevates risk for uh, being, uh, being involved in serious violence. And um, so the violence both causes those traumas, right, and, and, and there's sort of a circular process here. Um, but it, it, I, I think our next panel will actually be able to speak to some of these things because uh, that, that they underlie some of the intervention models mm -hmm. that, are, that are designed. Not only, I mean, we, we don't have just one thing in our tool bag of just focusing on guns. There are behavioral dimensions to this that really will be exciting to hear about in our next panel. With that, I know that the, the clock is uh, um, cutting down. Let me just uh, ask each one of our panelists, they could just give me a just a quick uh, one or two word thought, and um, we'll close this panel out. Um, I, I'll just say, um, you know, there's general agreement that um, individuals who have histories of violence uh, and dangerous behaviors should not have firearms. There really is not much debate about that. The question really is, how do you effectively do that? I think our panel today really provided some great examples of how you can do that. Uh, licensing, for uh, without a doubt, we see so consistently uh, playing this effective role in that fundamental thing that, again, is not, not debatable, right? We don't want people with histories of violence to have guns. Um, so, we, so we have tools. We're expanding them uh, uh, with extreme risk protection order laws. Um, and, and so basically, in my mind, it is are we actually going to take this seriously? I, I feel like some of our policies are kind of just around the edges, and they aren't really investing in creating systems that actually achieve that critical objective, and including the enforcement part. So that's the theme that I see, is um, there are policy tools that work. Um, you can't do them on the cheap. You actually have to create systems that they work. Dr. Kosasi, did you have any... I would just add, as we've heard today and this morning, and we'll hear a little bit later, it's not one thing. Gun, gun violence is not a one solution problem. It's going to take a multifaceted approach, and it can't just be policy. It has to be resource investment. It has to be um, individual and community level interventions as well as policy. Dr. Zell? Yeah, I, I would add to to that that you know the policies really do need to be implemented. We cannot stop with just the passage of the policies. And some of these are pretty you know, difficult and complicated to implement. Relinquishment of guns for those who are now prohibited from having them can be complicated, but we have a number of communities that are getting it done safely and legally, and we need to look to those models. And I would say, looking to those models, there's no better way to do that through, than through research, than through rigorous um, research that can really light the way as to how we can be most effective with regard to our implementation and enforcement efforts. Doug Swanson. So we're here today speaking to a debate at the national level that has come to the fore because of concern out of mass shootings. But every day that there's a mass shooting, 100 other people die all around the United States, and the circumstances are diverse. Suicides, domestic violence incidents, arguments gone bad between um, a, impulsive young men in the middle of the night who happen to have a gun. The problem is very complex and with lots of diverse factors, everything from downstream solutions to trying to remove access to a gun of a person in a moment of crisis 
to moving way upstream and trying to figure out how we have healthier communities with fewer kids exposed to trauma who might uh, grow up to be perpetrators. All of those things need to work together and they're going to take a long time. There's not a way to wave a wand and suddenly make this problem go away. We have to, and I think all of us are in it for the long haul, and we hope that uh, we've been able to communicate that today. Can you give our panel a round of applause? <laughs> We're going to take a 10-minute break to switch panels, um, so we'll be with you in about 10 minutes.
Hello, everybody. Um, I think we're going to get going in about uh, two minutes. So please uh, sit down. Great, I think we are back. So um, thank you for tuning in to uh, Policies That Work to Reduce Gun Violence. Uh, I am Josh Sharpstein from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and we're here for the second half of this morning's event. I want to uh, particularly thank our partners at the American Public Health Association for working with us in putting this on. Um, and uh, I want to say uh, thank you to the people who are here, to the people who are watching on the webcast, the people who are joining online, um, and say that this is um, a great conversation and it's one that is going to continue past today. We're going to make not only the whole video available, but pieces of the video available. And um, unfortunately, as these uh, many different kinds of tragedies keep going, we will be trying in every way possible to introduce evidence about what works into the policy discussions um, around uh, the country and here in Washington. Um, one other thing, uh, during the first session, I was I had a prime tweeting seat right here. I was taking pictures and tweeting. I did the Jeopardy tweet. I did the dog GIF. I did everything I possibly could to call attention, but I can't do that while I'm up here. So I'm counting on people here in the room to tweet using hashtag gun policies that work and people who are watching online to join the conversation at hashtag gun policies that work. So, um, we are now going to uh, talk about a whole different set of policies uh, with strong evidence for them that uh, reduce gun violence. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shani Bugs uh, for the next presentation. She is a postdoctoral fellow in violence prevention research at the University of California at Davis. Uh, she's also an affiliated research analyst with the Center for Gun Policy and Research at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Bugs. Thank you, Josh, and good morning, everyone. The group violence intervention and cure violence models are two of the most well-known strategies for reducing gun violence among individuals most at risk for violence. Both approaches are rooted in the concentration of violence theory, which suggests that a substantial proportion of violence in any given community is driven by a small number of people. Research in cities across the country, including Newark, New Orleans, Seattle, Oakland, and Chicago has found that the majority of gun violence is committed by a single digit percentage of those cities' populations. Research has also found that there is great overlap between those who commit violence and those who become victims of it due to similar geography, social and peer networks, and risk behaviors. So by concentrating on those individuals who are at greatest risk for violence victimization or perpetration, communities can see potentially substantial reductions in gun violence. This conceptual model, highlights, highlighting the similarities between the group violence intervention and cure violence, was adapted from one created by Dr. Katerina Roman at Temple University. It shows that both strategies aim to identify those at greatest risk for violence, to interrupt conflicts before they escalate 
or continue a cycle of retaliation, and to engage community organizations and members in the strategies. Through these actions, the objective of steering individuals and groups away from violent situations can be achieved, which then leads to declines in gun violence and a shift in the acceptability of violence as a means to reduce, excuse me, as a means to handle disputes and conflicts. However, these interventions accomplish these outcomes through two very different processes. The Group Violence Intervention, or GVI for short, was developed in the 1990s by criminologist David Kennedy. And it has since been referred to as focused deterrence, pulling levers, the group violence reduction strategy, or ceasefire. The model relies on the threat of law enforcement intervention for those who do not heed warnings of severe consequences if gun violence continues. The strategy entails the formation of a cross-agency enforcement team, including local, police, city, state, and federal prosecutors, federal law enforcement agencies, and parole and probation departments. It utilizes data and intel from frontline police officers and detectives to identify key individuals within groups involved in violent activity. The enforcement team then develops a strategy to influence the behaviors of those individuals and groups by using all possible legal sanctions against them. Once the strategy has been determined, a call-in or personal notification meeting is held to directly communicate that the gun violence must stop and that there will be severe sanctions and enforcement actions if it does not. The message from law enforcement is accompanied by messages from community members who have been negatively impacted by gun violence and who implore the individuals to cease the harmful activity. And the model includes a concrete offer of services from local agencies and community-based organizations to support behavior and lifestyle changes. If a shooting does occur following a call-in or notification meeting, and the police determine that it involved a member of one of the groups represented in the meeting, then the enforcement team delivers on its promise of harsh consequences to the entire group. Since its formal development, the focused deterrence model has been applied to various types of crime concerns, including illicit drug selling, and has been evaluated over two dozen times. A 2018 systematic review of focused deterrence interventions found that nearly 80% of the evaluations showed that the interventions significantly reduced crime and that the greatest impact was found when the approach focused specifically on curbing violence. For example, in Lowell, Massachusetts, the intervention was associated with a 44% reduction in gun assaults, with no evidence that the violence was displaced to other areas. In New Orleans, the intervention was associated with a 17% reduction in total firearm homicides, and an over 30% reduction in homicides among those whose groups were represented in the call-in meetings. And Indianapolis saw a 40% reduction in homicides following the intervention's implementation. However, there are several points to note regarding the GVI. First, the model has evolved over the past 20 plus years since it was first introduced. And different jurisdictions have interpreted the significance and application of the components of the strategy differently. We also know that although many replications of the model have been independently evaluated, other cities that have not undergone evaluation have opted to implement some or all of the strategies so we don't know the full scope of the model's effectiveness. The evaluations that have been done have only examined the intervention's impact for around one to two years, so the model's ability to reduce violence over longer time periods is unclear. Additionally, several evaluation studies have found that threats to model fidelity can occur at several stages of implementation, which can undermine the success of the intervention in a given community. And importantly, because the GVI is most impactful when its focus is on the specific behavior of gun violence perpetration, rather than criminal behavior or group identity more broadly, it requires a fundamental shift in policing strategy and in engagement with communities that are often already distrustful of law enforcement. The Cure Violence Model 
is premised on a much different approach to violence deterrence. Originally known as Ceasefire Chicago, where it was first applied, the model is based on evidence that violent behavior, like infectious diseases, exhibits properties of contagion, including clustering, transmission, and spread effects. The model entails three specific components, interrupting violence transmission by mediating conflicts and limiting the likelihood of retaliation, identifying those at greatest risk for violence involvement and reducing their risk through behavior change and li linkage to needed services, and changing community norms around violence through community mobilization and anti-violence messaging. The intervention employs street outreach workers to develop relationships with the individuals at high risk for violence. The outreach workers often themselves have had criminal or violent histories and are well known in the communities in which they work. They have also undergone personal transformations and desire to steer the individuals with whom they work away from violence. Being previously engaged in or familiar with the very behaviors and activities they hope to change increases the likelihood that the outreach workers will be seen by their intended clients as credible messengers and potentially trustworthy resources. The staff then serve as role models who can exhibit pro-social behavior while helping to link individuals and their families to critical supports and services. Through those relationships and supports, program participants and those around them will ideally choose positive paths of development and conflict resolution. The model also employs special outreach workers who operate primarily as violence interrupters, working to identify, mediate, and de-escalate potentially dangerous conflicts that could lead to shootings. The violence interrupters play an essential part in teaching nonviolent dispute resolution and minimizing the spread of violence by interrupting retaliation following a violent incident. Because of the need to build genuine and trusted relationships with those at greatest risk for violence in order to mediate conflicts and effectively help provide support, it is critically important that the outreach workers and violence interrupters maintain a clear distinction from law enforcement. Though the employment of street outreach workers to connect with and help redirect individuals involved in violent activity has existed for decades, the cure violence model was developed and codified in the 1990s by epidemiologist Gary Slutkin. The model has since been replicated in dozens of cities in the US and around the world with numerous independent evaluations. Those evaluations have yielded mixed program results. For instance, in Chicago, the program was associated with reductions in non-fatal shootings in some but not all of the communities where it was implemented, and program effects on group-involved homicides and retaliatory shootings varied across sites. In Philadelphia, the program was associated with a 30% reduction in non-fatal shootings two years after it was implemented, while in Baltimore, the program was associated with reductions in homicides or non-fatal shootings but not both, in three of the four communities where it was implemented. And more recent evaluations show that its effects have attenuated over time. Several evaluations have also examined Cure Violence's influence on attitude changes about the acceptance of violence to handle conflicts. They found that the program was associated with significant improvements in attitudes towards violence, and with increased confidence in relying on police to intervene when violence occurs. However, like the GVI, several cure violence replication sites have encountered major implementation challenges, from hiring the right outreach workers, to adequately supporting those who work in the program, to providing program clients with sufficient and appropriate service linkages. And there have been some concerns about the program's ability to sustain reductions in gun violence over time, due in part to the evolution of the nature of gun violence over time, and who may be seen in a community as credible messengers with influence to intervene in conflicts. In interviews with street outreach workers and violence interruption workers, researchers have found that some types of grievances, such as those involving retaliation for the murder of a family member or friend, are more difficult to mediate than others. 
There can also be problematic tensions between program workers and law enforcement who can sometimes view the alternative strategy as counterproductive to their own violence reduction efforts. We have learned important lessons from the implementation and evaluations of the GVI and cure violence models. Some cities have used those lessons, along with requests from communities most impacted by gun violence, to reimagine public safety and combine the approaches, while also incorporating essential elements such as case management, mentorship, and healing through cognitive behavioral therapy. New York, Oakland, and Los Angeles have each achieved impressive citywide reductions in gun violence by focusing less on any particular model and authentically engaging with communities, allowing for collaborative strategic planning and meaningful feedback loops. <clears throat> they seek to meet individuals where they are on their change readiness and personal goals, and they provide wraparound services to address program participants' needs. They have integrated elements of life coaching, restorative justice, and community empowerment into program offerings. They prioritize approaches that encourage positive police community engagement. And most importantly, they have allocated substantial and sustained resources for gun violence prevention programs, their participants, and the staff doing the work. Knowing what we know, policymakers at every level of government, mayors, city managers, city council members, state governors and, and legislators, congresspeople and federal agency heads should recognize that public safety starts before and extends far beyond police and emergency services. Local officials should authentically engage residents in the development of public safety plans for their communities so that the residents can help drive the changes they want to see. Local and state lawmakers should invest in strategies that concentrate on those at greatest risk for violence, that employ community members in both messaging and action, that provide bona fide support to individuals and families by connecting them to the services they need to aid lifestyle change, and that foster trust building and reconciliation between police and communities. And finally, Congress should allocate long-term funding and devote resources to spur innovation and gun violence reduction approaches, especially those that are community driven and community approved, and to effectively evaluate promising interventions for their impact and scalability. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that great presentation. I'm next going to ask uh, Dr. Carnell Cooper, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Northeast Methodist Hospital, to come and talk about hospital-based interventions. So we're going to move from the community to the hospital. Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. So I showed this first slide only to uh, let you know that the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Programs has changed its title, and we're now the Health Alliance of Violence Intervention. This is the uh, organization that really uh, tries to promote the proliferation of hospital-based violence intervention programs. Uh, I am a trauma surgeon, and 30 to 60 percent of all our patients who are seen at, at our nation's trauma centers for violent injuries return to that trauma center with another violent injury. Now, if that were, if there, if there was a medication or a procedure to fill that amount of time, we wouldn't have it. But that's the data at our nation's trauma centers. When those patients return, we know that they have a higher likelihood of dying. Data from the Lincoln Center uh, in the Bronx in New York in 2012 showed that that patients who presented to their EEDs for penetrating trauma injuries, who came back for a second or third time, were 10 times more likely to die than the person who presented the first time. Therefore, at our trauma centers, when we see our patients, we have an opportunity, perhaps, perhaps even an obligation, to offer something other than patching them up and sending them out again. And that's where hospital-based violence intervention 
programs have an up, ha, come into the breach. That's the space that they come in. We see that patient when they ar arrive at the hospital after they've been stabilized, multiple operations and surgery, while they're sitting in the bed with that incision on their belly with multiple tubes and multiple orifices, families at the bedside crying and wondering if they're going to survive. And for the first time, that patient's life may have slowed down enough to begin to look at what is what's going on in their life, a teachable moment. And that's the time when we see the patient at bedside and begin to address the issues that put that patient at risk for being a victim of violence. So what are those risk factors? Well, they're, being, they're living in a dangerous neighborhood, a violent neighborhood. They are, uh, they are uh, being poor, being poverty. They are having less than a high school education, uh, being involved in, uh, I call substance abuse, being from a, 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 a single parent family, having a history of being abused, uh, having been a part of the criminal justice systems. That's just some of the factors that put them at risk. And the idea behind hospital-based violence intervention programs is to meet that patient at the bedside and begin to address that issue. At the right, at the top of the screen there, you can see the hospital VIP team that, be, that is part of the folks who begin to address those issues. The most important member of our team is the prevention specialist. That's an individual that often grow, has grown up in the same neighborhood that that patient is, is a, a peer who meets up at the bedside and begins that conversation, begins to build a relation, relationship. And then once that patient's out of the hospital, he's gonna help that patient get, uh, fill out a job application, which we think may be simple. But for some of our clients who never had a job, who's challenging? For that client that has never finished high school, filling out a job application is not something that he or she's gonna to admit to, but it can be challenging. So that prevention specialist helps them fill out the job application, makes sure they're properly dressed to go to that job interview, accomplish that job interview, helps them fill out that GED applications, helps them get into the GED programs. In other words, it's meeting, the, meeting that patient or that client where they are and moving them forward. And that prevention specialist is the most important part of that team. All you can see, the team is fairly, fairly, fairly robust. So what is the data that says that this approach works? Well, you can see on the screen here, there, there are uh, three studies. Uh, all of them randomized perspective studies from uh, one from my team at the Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore, the other from Dr. Zun in Chicago, uh, uh, all showing robust differences in recidivism, meaning returning to the hospital for nonviolent injuries compared to the control group, randomized prospective studies. Dr. Habitonis' group from VCU, not quite robust, but, but his study is small numbers and didn't have quite as much support as the other two studies. And you can see in the mentored studies and the case management studies for pediatrics, again, significant improvements in those patients who got the intervention. And this is just a, uh, a number of studies that have again, been done, including ones I showed you, that have been done in the past 10 years, all showing that this is a, a, an, a, a policy, this is a program that works, that reduces violence, that, that actually, used to, it, that save, saves lives. When we started, when we did our, our study at, at Shock Trauma Center, we had, we debated for do a case control versus randomized effective study. The case, so a social worker in our team that we sat in the room with for months developing it said, I want to do a case control study. And she said, it's because if we don't do a case control study, someone who could live will die, who won't get the program will die if you do a randomized pick study. And there was this other person in there who said, I understand that, respect that, but the gold standard for this work is randomized effective studies. And if I'm going to convince these crabby, cynical surgeons, that these kind of programs work, that's where we're gonna have to go. And I, of course, was that person on the other end of that trail. So in our study, there were 100 patients. Two patients died during that study. Both of them in the non-intervention group. I still see that social worker, she still smiles and reminds me of that decision. So, so opportunities. There is, there, there, there are 
we are now partnering with both the American College of Surgeons and the American College of Emergency Medicine to try to get more hospital-based programs within, the, within our institutions. The data shows that it works. How can we build more? How can we make sure they follow the model that I described to you? Again, that results in lives being, in lives being, sa being saved. The other is, is, is for having more of a conversation about violence from a public health perspective, instead of it being simply from a law enforcement perspective. In the neighborhoods that, that I grew up in, violence was just a part of it. There was, there, there was the alcohol, there were um, poverty, there was domestic violence, uh, there were fights. It was a part of the milieu. There were buildings that were vacant. There were rodents that Dr. Brown is going to tell you about next. It was just a part of, the pro of, of that neighborhood. If we're going to address violence, then we got to address all of those things, those risk factors that put people at risk for the, from those kinds of neighborhoods. If you grew up in a neighborhood where domestic violence and gunshot wounds are part of who you are, then that is, that is the way you develop. Yeah. That was part of my neighborhood. That was the way it was a daily weekend routine. If we're going to address tissue, we must can address those those public health issues that begin to that that are going to resolve those. Now I mentioned earlier the the frontline workers, the prevention specialists. Two, two years ago, we went to a national claim of the claim commission for uniform codes, and asked that our prevention specialists be awarded a code to be able to be billed for by Medicaid and other third party payers because the work that they do warrants it. It's the same thing that we do with some community workers, uh, or workers the same thing we do with peer reviews for opioid abuse and, uh, and for some mental health issues. So we were able, after a, being, re being rejected the first time, we went back again, and now our permission specialists are on the uniform claim code, taxonomy, taxonomy code. The next step in the process is how do we now get Medicaid authority party payers to recognize the work that they do and begin to reimburse them for, for that. And that's, again, why we continue to push for the data that shows the work that, that they do is, is possible. So we've had some, there's some opportunities and, and we've had some successes. I want to uh, highlight that there in, in New Jersey, uh, this past year, there was bill, the bills outlined there. The first bill was we were able to ask to get the commissioner to work with hospital-based violence program to try to increase the numbers. The second bill outlined there says uh, that it requires that all level one and level two trauma centers have a hospital-based violence intervention program. And finally, the third bill uh, that from Jersey uh, is requires that VOCA, violence, the Victim of Crime, Crime Act, provide funding for those hospital-based violence intervention programs. Prevention programs. And finally, the last bill that we taught line is on, is on Governor Newsom's test in California. It's geared towards being able to reimburse the prevention specialists for the work that they are, are doing. So those are the things, those are, those are some of the successes. If you interview you from California, you know, can get the word to Governor Newsom, I would very much appreciate it. Um, and finally, the recommendations. Not, not surprisingly, and I think our data su supports it, is we recommend that hospital trauma centers around our nation who see violent injuries, and we, on, the, on my slides is 100. I don't know what the exact number is, and that's up to debate, but patient hospital trauma centers who see a significant number of violent injured patients should have a hospital-based program. It offers that patient a reason, again, a, 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 something that will help them not come back again. Keeping in mind, as I said earlier, if they come back again to our nation's trauma center, their likelihood of dying is higher. So we have an opportunity and obligation, from my perspective, to offer something to them. It also provides for the staff, those surgeons like myself and nurses who are seeing those patients come in to say, we have something else to offer. 
we have something that, that will keep that patient coming back again. So they aren't feeling like, gee whiz, we're just gonna pass. But what we're doing is they're gonna come back anyway. That program offers them a support, offers them something different that says they, that we can do, that we can keep them, keep them uh, from coming back. And finally, funding. You know, hospitals, obviously, as you all know, on a very slim margin. And they're looking for things that are, for, that are gonna affect their ROI. They don't see this necessarily affect the ROI. It does impact readmissions, as we've shown our data, but otherwise, the ROI is not there. So we need to find ways of supporting this program. The Victims of the Crime Act is one of those agencies that, that we have been able to work with to support programs across, across, the, across the country. And that is an opportunity and recommendation that, we, that more of that money be from, the, from the VOCA funds and, and other in, in the DOJ and other federal organizations be able to support this, uh, uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, this process. And finally, getting back to that prevention specialist who, again, is most important part of our team. Over the past year, the health care for the, the Alliance for, for, for Violence Prevention has developed a 35-hour certificate program. We want to make sure, once we got the taxonomy code in place, we wanted to make sure that we had a uniform way of making sure that those specialists all received the same level of training. So that the care that they're offering our patients is uniform. The same as you would expect from a social worker or from a surgeon or a physician, et cetera. We want to make sure they all had a certain level of training. So over the past two years, actually, we felt the certificate, the the certificate of training that essentially 35 hours, as I said earlier, that will allow them to come away with a baseline of training experiences necessary to offer support to necessarily move these patients, these patients forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. Um, our next speaker is going to speak about reducing blight in urban areas as a strategy to reduce gun violence. He is Dr. Charles Branas, the Gelman Endowed Professor and Chair in the Department of Epidemiology at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and the Columbia Center for Injury Science and Prevention. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. It's a pleasure to be here to come speak with you. Um, ah. So over a decade ago, uh, some of our research teams uh, frankly became a little frustrated uh, by the progress we were having in different cities in terms of reducing violence and gun violence in particular. And we did something that uh, is far too unusual for researchers. We went out to the communities and we asked the communities that were most effective what is it that you think is generating the violence and the gun violence in your neighborhoods? And we got a number of different answers, ranging from family structures, um, youth who were committing the, these violent acts. But the one thing that came up over and over again across all different uh, types of neighborhoods and different people uh, was this recurring theme of the abandonment and the vacancy and the physical dilapidation of their neighborhoods and that they knew because they were witnessing it on the day to day that this physical dilapidation and for lack of a better word blight uh, in those city neighborhoods was generating the violence. Now it's been perhaps uh, 60 or 70 years that we've been in this terrible spiral in our cities. And I'm not just talking about our major cities, I'm talking about our midsize and our small cities as well in the United States. In this spiral of disinvestment, and by disinvestment I mean that people have pulled investments from cities, but much of it has been a systematic disinvestment with terrible policies such as redlining, uh, systematic uh, pushing people out and into neighborhoods or not permitting people to be in certain neighborhoods. That sort of disinvestment in resources and the capacity to have housing in certain neighborhoods um, has led to this spiral of crime being committed in those neighborhoods, which has led to people leaving the neighborhoods who can, yeah? And then that whole spiral continues. That abandonment leads to greater disinvestment, which leads to crime, and these cities have spiraled down in the past uh, 50 or 60 years. 
Some cities have lost nearly half their populations uh, from the 1950s. Um, cities like Detroit and Philadelphia, who, which are replete with properties just like this. Abandoned buildings and abandoned vacant land uh, in these cities has grown to epic proportions. Um, so one of the things to consider is what, what can we do about this? We have these, and what the neighbors told us in, the, in these neighborhoods over and over again was these are the things. They know that the shootings are happening. They know that the city is probably not responding as well as they think to these shootings. But this, these are the things that they see on a day-to-day -day when they go walk to work, go to the bus, right, go to the subway, send their kids to school. This is the surroundings that Dr. Cooper was just talking about um, that people see on a daily basis. And this begins to erode your health and probably your safety. And I want to talk about that a little bit more now. So this, for those of you who have not visited Europe, this is a map of Switzerland. Yeah? With work that we've done and earlier work from the Brookings Institution, if you take this map of Switzerland and you add up all those abandoned spaces in cities around the nation, the space and the square footage and the square mileage of those, um, of those abandoned spaces adds up to an area the size of Switzerland in the United States. This is a massive challenge. Yeah? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue to you right now that this is also, it is a major challenge. But as we thought maybe 10, 15 years ago and others are beginning to see, this is also a great opportunity um, to do something and to have an impact and to make changes on our cities and perhaps uh, on the gun violence in our cities. Now, uh, public health, since we're in a Public Health is sponsored by the American Public Health Association. Public health and epidemiologists are fond of talking about um, their desire to, to focus on three things. People, pathogens, meaning diseases themselves, and places. Now, if you talk to, for instance, if you think about people who are trying to prevent malaria, they are going to focus on, well, putting, giving people bed nets, for instance, to not let the mosquitoes in, right? Giving people uh, different sort of anti-malarial drugs to prevent the disease from circulating in their bodies. But it is a classic approach in malaria prevention to also focus on the standing water and the spaces and places that are generating the malaria, the mosquitoes and the malaria in the first place, and to fill them in, yeah? This is no different, frankly, oops, it is a analogous situation with our firearms, yes, and firearm injury and the people who are affected and the places. Now, we focus and we've talked a great deal today um, about the people and the firearms. We devoted an entire panel to the firearms and to, to the credit of this group, we want to find multiple ways, not simply focusing on the firearms, but bringing in other approaches. And unfortunately, we have not focused as much on the places and the surroundings that may be generating and cultivating um, this firearm violence in the first place. So very importantly, I want to tell you about a number of the things that our group has done, but also that other groups and cities around the nation have done. Cities like Philadelphia, Newark, um, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, New Orleans. These are cities where a number of different studies have been done, uh, both observational studies, meaning that the folks in the city and the, their university partners uh, studied what the city implemented in terms of place-based solutions to gun violence, but also there have been now a number of randomized controlled trials, that is true experiments of these different sorts of treatments to these abandoned and vacant places and spaces, buildings, and land in cities. Um, and you get a sense here, I wanted to just show this to you briefly. Um, these experiments run by picking, randomly choosing spaces in cities, perhaps a small percentage of them because we can't afford to do them all in the context of a study, where a city might have perhaps 50, 60,000 such spaces in, uh, in an inventory of buildings and land in the city and lots. The yellow in the, uh, on the uh, left side of that uh, slide is the red is the chosen lot. The yellow are all the other abandoned lots in that particular space. 
So you get a sense of some blocks and some streets, people are living with perhaps half the, half the buildings or half the spaces in their neighborhood are this way, or like the pictures I just showed you. Again, very difficult to step out and see that on a day-to-day -day basis. So what did these uh, randomized controlled trials tell us? Well, I'm going to tell you about the findings for some of the greening, that is the vacant lot greening studies that we've done, and some of the uh, abandoned building studies that we've done, where you take spaces that look like the spaces on your left, and you move to the right through very simple and inexpensive processes. Yeah? And these are processes, by the way, that originated. The process, the recipe for this, the cookbook for this, originated with single neighborhoods and single cities where some motivated residents said, we're just going to do this. We're going to try it on a couple of these. And many cities have now um, uh, scaled this up because it's very inexpensive and quite scalable. And what they're finding, if you go from left to right here, is across a variety of studies whether it be greening, fixing the buildings, we have a great new lighting experiment that's just come out in New York City, or planting trees. Some of the earliest work was planting trees in the city of Chicago. These studies have generated and have shown across them uh, anywhere from 6 to 56 percent less uh, gun violence. But not just gun violence when you treat these sorts of things, also vandalism and other sorts of crimes are, are affected by this. And very importantly, we uh, have teamed up with a number of different economists to look at what a city would get back. What do taxpayers, what does the society and the communities in that city get back? So for every dollar investment invested in these programs, because they are so inexpensive to green lots and to treat abandoned buildings, to remediate abandoned buildings, and because gun violence is so expensive, okay? The trade-off here is for every dollar in, there are hundreds of dollars returned um, to the taxpayers and to the neighborhoods of that city. So the return on investment here is quite high, quite effective and quite high. And we think of this as a, as a form of what we're calling win-win science. So this is the opportunity for scientists to actually not just generate knowledge uh, and new, new thinking about what can be done uh, about something like gun violence, a prime public health crisis, um, but it also brings resources to those neighborhoods. The, the studies that have already been uh, done have uh, changed thousands of different buildings and vacant lots in cities across the nation just by doing the research itself uh, in an effort to study it. So things like gun violence go down. Yeah, you can see that on, on the left. But also things like nuisance crimes and vandalism, um, Public drunkenness, these sorts of things also go down quite a bit. But then people go outside more is one of the things we find as part of this. And not only does the violence that is reported to police and, re and reported and recorded by police go down, but neighbors feel safer. They're also self-reporting that the crime went down and the gun violence went down in their neighborhoods. So briefly, how does it work? Well, the primary way that this works is um, because these spaces, the abandoned buildings and the abandoned lots, and right next to the spaces, perhaps abandoned cars, that are put purposely near those spaces are opportunities uh, for the storage of illegal firearms. So the police will call these, frankly, storage lockers for illegal guns. If you remove the storage lockers, you're having an impact on the means of the violence itself, which is one way we think it happens. The other way we think that the reduction occurs is because you know, neighbors have been living with these, as I said, for decades, these sorts of spaces. Um, once you clean and green or get a building uh, fixed up, neighbors do not want it to return to the way it was. So they will go out of their way to informally police that space on a day-to-day -day basis. They do not want someone perhaps selling drugs in front of that space or, or doing anything with a firearm in front of that space. So they will move that person off the space and ask them not to do it. And in the end, this does not move crime around the corner. It actually reduces the commission of these acts. And then the last way is because neighbors are coming outside more, they are able to connect with one another and share information uh, to a greater degree. So the recommendations that I have at the end of this uh, coming out of it is that we really do need to infuse and include um, these sorts of population-wide and place-based uh, interventions, which, as I was showing with the malaria example, 
these, are, these interventions, if we use them for gun violence, we would be standing on the shoulders of many other public health interventions that preceded these. Whether it be for infectious diseases like malaria, it could be the, the purification of drinking water, the chlorination of our water systems, it could be removing lead poisoning from buildings. This is built on the backs of that kind of work, but focused on uh, the reduction of gun violence. So we're in good company. Um, and then gun violence interventions to change these blighted and abandoned spaces are A, I, I have to say they're well studied at the highest level of science. So we do have not just observational studies, but we have a series of citywide experiments that have been done to demonstrate that these work. Um, so they are effective. They are inexpensive, very important to understand. These are not, this is not building the High Line in New York City. Yeah, so these are inexpensive singular uh, introductions and placements in neighborhoods that are distributed. Uh, one reporter called these building the park of a thousand pieces in a city. They are distributed and they are designed not to have people move out of their neighborhoods, but to give people opportunities for parks uh, and not dilapidated spaces right next to their homes. They don't need to go anywhere and they get to stay in their neighborhood. They are, are, again, because they're expensive, they're scalable citywide for a very relatively low amount of money compared to other, and finally, they're apolitical. This is not taking firearms out of the hands of any legal owners. This is just opportunities to, to impact the illegal uh, storage and movement and usage, misusage of uh, illegal firearms in cities. And then finally, I'll, I'll have a pitch to say that um, I, I would like to see city and state legislators, but also federal policymakers, to begin to invest in as a first step for a city to do this sort of thing, a city must have an anti-blight ordinance. Um, you'd be surprised how many cities do not or have an, in, uh, 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 an, imp an impotent anti-blight ordinance. And so we need that legislation to be in place for many cities, but then we also need to, again, direct the resources to this kind of uh, reduction in uh, dilapidated and abandoned spaces across cities in, in the US. And the return on the investment could be quite high um, to do this. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Banas. Our last speaker is going to talk about gun violence research. She is Dr. Linda Degudis, the executive director of the Defense Health Horizons and an adjunct professor at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Good morning. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about the some of the issues that have occurred with federal research funding and some of the issues that have occurred with research agendas. Um, we've heard a lot of a lot of reports of research this morning, and um, obviously um, a number of things that are successful, but we really don't see as much research on gun violence as we do on other diseases that are causing public health, you know, our, our major public health problems. So um, basically the federal funding for research has been at a pretty much a standstill since the Dickey Amendment passed in 1996. That amendment actually didn't say that research could not be funded. All it said was that federal money couldn't be used for advocacy for gun control is what it basically what it said. So um, it didn't say you couldn't do the research. However, the conversations that went on around it basically um, threatened the CDC in saying, oh, well, if you do fund the research on gun violence, um, we're going to start to think about shutting you down or shut down the injury center, which had been formed um, not all that long before. Um, so that amendment then uh, a few years ago was added to the NIH um, appropriations bill, um, and we still see restrictions on the federal funding. But basically, funding from 2004 to 2014 for gun violence uh, research was only $20 million. And in the context of the federal budget and what gets spent on other things, it's basically um, decimal dust, is the way policymakers would put it. Um, but it doesn't mean much. It's like the pennies that are in your pocket, you know. So um, after Sandy Hook, after the Sandy Hook killings occurred, President Obama issued an executive order that 
um, told CDC to resume the research on violence, resume the funding on gun violence research. I told Congress to appropriate $10 million, another you know, few cents, basically, to fund gun violence research. And then it told CV CDC to develop a public health research agenda and ask federal agencies to study the causes of gun violence, to identify what interventions could be effective, and then to develop strategies. However, there was not any funding associated with this, and so there were a number of things that did not happen. Um, what did happen was that at the CDC, we worked to um, develop a, a research agenda, but um, that was not without some fighting. Um, at the time, I was the director of the Injury Center um, and said that we could not internally develop that agenda because it would be seen as biased, and so we had to fight to have it go over to the Institute of Medicine and have them do it. They did develop the research agenda and published it in um, June of 2013. Um, and that was basically, you know, that's basically about all that happened out of that list of things in the executive orders. There was no resumption of funding of gun violence research by the CDC. The message that um, was given was that there was no funding for it. There was no, no thought to using funding that was there for violence research. Um, that was not something that was allowed, and this, was, this came from a higher level. It was all political. Um, people were afraid to do something. They were afraid to say, okay, we're gonna start funding the research because there was still that fear that um, we were going to lose money. Uh, CDC would lose money. Um, so to me, it was kind of being chicken. Um, we'd seen so many events, we'd seen so many things going on, we knew how many deaths there are, but um, the research was not funded. So um, on the left-hand side of this um, slide, you can see research funding for various diseases. And that little, little <coughs> tiny bit at the bottom, it, the fourth one up, is where the money uh, goes towards gun violence research. So the proportion of money that goes towards research on gun violence, one of the leading killers, especially of young people, is very minimal. Um, and it just is not sufficient or comparable to what gets funded for other diseases. So um, basically, you know, we, we have a long way to go. But what we do know is that research funding for other leading causes of death and illness and disability have really made a major dent in those um, illnesses and those causes and those injuries. And one of the um, examples is motor vehicle crashes. We know that there was, you know, especially back in the late 80s, early 90s, there were a lot more deaths in motor vehicle crashes than there are now. The reason is that we did a lot of things in order to prevent them. We didn't take away cars because they were killing people. Okay, everybody still can get in a car and <coughs> drive, but we did other things. Um, we found out what might work as far as vehicle redesign. We found out what kinds of things might work as far as vehicle redesign for um, preventing some pedestrian injuries, um, the interiors of vehicles. Um, some people may remember that a lot of the knobs were pointed or something, and if somebody hit something during a crash, you could have a fairly serious injury. And I remember, and Carnell probably does too, seeing people with you know like things embedded in various parts of their body in the emergency department because the vehicles had these very dangerous kind of um, things on the inside. Those don't exist anymore in the manufacture of vehicles. We made the roads safer. We did other things on roads. We found out that maybe putting a, um, a big sand barrel in front of a bridge abutment um, really absorbed the energy if a car crashed into it, as opposed to the car crashing into the solid concrete barrier. So there's a lot of things that we did and we did improve things. We uh, have changed driver's licensing now so that there's graduated licensure laws in most states so that people have to, young people have to have experience riding with someone, driving with someone who is an adult who's a licensed driver for a period of time before they can get a license. So um, those have all been effective. 
So we know that those kinds of things can work. One of the other things we know is that the lack of research really limits progress. It doesn't allow us to understand what works. What it does is it sets things up so that people say, well, I think this would work, so let's just do this. Um, oh, I think this would work, let's do this. And we invest a lot of time and money in things that don't work. They end up not working because we don't have any research to tell us what will work. Um, we just have emotion and we have people's ideas, you know, and it doesn't work necessarily. I mean, the ideas maybe need to be tested, but, you know, just think about um, some of the things that have come out now, you know, on policy and things like, um, oh, uh, in some states, giving teachers, arming teachers. Is that an effective policy or is it more likely to be detrimental? What about active shooter drills? We're finding out now that those may be more detrimental to the kids in the long term um, than they are as far as actually helping kids survive something that happens. Um, what about um, bulletproof backpacks? You know, um, somebody's, it's a great marketing strategy that somebody has playing on parents' fears. But, you know, what, how effective are these? We have no evidence that they really would work and the child would have to be wearing the backpack when a shooter came in. And then it, we even don't know if it would work depending on you know, the, the um, angle the shooter was coming from. So we don't have a lot of things that we know um, work. Federal funding is definitely influenced by politics and as um, Dr. Webster mentioned earlier, the um, groups that can come in and lobby on a single issue and advocate for things on a single issue. Um, so we need to have other funding. Private funding can fill some of those gaps, can help retain some independence in the research questions that are asked and allow people to ask a number of research questions. Um, and then uh, basically, I think the other piece of it is having having funding that is going to academic centers where people can decide what questions they want to ask. You know, they have the independence. You're a researcher at a university. You don't, the university doesn't tell you what questions you can ask as far as your research goes. Um, if you're in a federal agency, the federal agency may tell you what questions you can ask as far as your research goes. Um, you know, having been, I mean, when I got to the CDC, somebody told me, don't even say the word G-U-N, okay? Because it's, it's just not a good idea because we might get in trouble. So, you know, um, that doesn't happen <laughs> in academia. You know, you can, you can research whatever you want. So I think those are the kinds of things that we need to think about as far as where the research gets done too, that it needs to be done by people who are more independent in their research, can ask the tough questions, and can test things out um, and do the research. So we have some um, opportunities. We have opportunities for um, basically to move as far as researchers go from just publishing the data to translating the data to the public so it can affect change or working with people who can translate that data so that the change can be affected. I mean, it may be that the people who are doing the research don't have the time or opportunity to do that, but there are people out there who can. They sometimes need some interpretation of the data or translation of it, um, but there are plenty of people who might advocate. Um, we can make science integral to identifying you know, these effective policies and really push for that and let um, policymakers know on all levels that this is what's really important. We should um, consider using more kinds of things that um, really provide collaboration, require collaboration. You know, we've heard about the need for a lot of disciplines to be involved in this, not just you know, not just one group, but it's you know, it's the hospitals, it's the community, it's um, social work, sociology, it's law enforcement, there's so many different groups that need to be involved and we really need to um, focus on having that kind of collaboration and involvement. So um, that's another thing we have an opportunity for. Training opportunities are other things. If we don't train people to do this research, we're not gonna have any researchers 
to do it later. We really need the training opportunities, and we need the funding for them. I mean, it's, it's not, um, it, those aren't there either. The training uh, funding isn't there the way it is for other kinds of health issues, so we really need that as well. Um, and certainly practice needs to inform the research as it has for a number of these studies that people have already been working on. Um, but we really need the practice to continue to inform the research and we need the multidisciplinary collaboration. So some recommendations. Um, Congress should fund gun violence research at a level that is similar to that for other public health epidemics such as um, the opioid overdose crisis, um, HIV, infectious disease. You know, how, how much money went to Ebola and how many cases of Ebola occurred in the United States, okay? I mean, so we should be funding, you know, spending a lot more money on gun violence. Um, Congress should fund um, improvements in the databases and ensure that researchers have access to those databases so that they can look at some of the impact of these policies and some of the strategies that are used. Um, it also would be important to have a core group of experts again look at priority research topics, perhaps um, revisit what was done at the Institute of Medicine and either update it or expand it, but have an, a more independent organization like that be able to convene the group so that the bias accusation is not there. Um, and, and it didn't come out before either. Um, Congress should also fund training and mentorship for people who are learning how to do this research. States can fund research and translation of research as well as the programs that are related to that research, and we have a couple of states that already have been doing that. Um, the private sector certainly can provide funding for um, any kinds of initiatives or research that are, are sort of related to the private sector's mission and um, the intent to keep, their, keep people healthy. And um, everyone should really focus on funding the research so that we know what works, not what we think will work. And really what they should do in summary is, you know, do what will really improve the health of the public and for legislators, not what will get you, what you think will get you reelected or elected. So um, that's where we should go. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, those were four fantastic presentations. I want to uh, thank you all for uh, traveling here and uh, helping us with this. And uh, we now have an opportunity for some questions and answers. And I wanted to start with one. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the previous panel talked about policies that sort of get put into effect and then implemented through legislation. Um, you all are, uh, th the three of you who talked about different kinds of policies are really, in a way, talking about um, institutional priorities. And um, it's beyond just what legislation could do, but what particular institutions could do. And as you're thinking about making the case to those institutions, I want to ask a question about the, the strength of the evidence. So for example, um, Dr. Bugs, you talked about um, evidence uh, for community-based violence interventions. And I'm going to ask you in a second, to talk about how that evidence compares to the evidence of law enforcement interventions. You know, um, Dr. Cooper, you talked about projects in the hospital, and I'd like you to think about, and I'll come back to you, how what hospitals could do to prevent recidivism compares to other things that hospitals do all the time. <laughs> and then, uh, Dr. Brownis, you talked about the value of cleaning up and improving um, uh, very uh, rundown areas in, in urban areas, and you know, cities have to make priorities uh, decisions all the time about where to put resources. Um, and I wonder if there's a good point of comparison as you think about talking to city policymakers to invest in these kinds of strategies. How does the evidence, like, where the other, you know, what, what kind of evidence are they looking at for the other ways that they might spend money? How does that compare? So we'll start with you. So we know that there are law enforcement strategies that can work to help reduce gun violence. And the strategies that have been most effective are those that, again, focus very specifically on the issue of gun violence. They are 
very precise and focused on individuals most at risk for violence and the problematic places, um, problematic street corners or bars, um, those kinds of places where violence <coughs> recurs. Um, but what we found is that the community-based strategies in terms of investment um, cost far less than law enforcement strategies. And importantly, you know, where law enforcement um, engages with communities that are most impacted by gun violence, those communities have often have great distrust of law enforcement and there is um, there's a, a breakdown in communication and in relationship between the community and the police. And so um, we know that law enforcement can make a difference in terms of gun violence reduction, but it is really important to engage the community in the kinds of changes that they want to see, as Dr. Brand has talked about, you know, going out into the community and asking the community what they want to see um, can direct us to the actual problems that are helping to create the gun violence, rather than assuming that we know what the problems are. So for a city that's looking at some very targeted law enforcement strategies, as well as community-based anti-violence initiatives, would you say that the impact of those is generally comparable, or would you say that one is clearly you know, better than the other? In other words, should this be part of a city's discussion if they're thinking about gun violence, as even as they're discussing law enforcement? So I'll re-echo the, the point that's been made, that there is not one policy, there's not one strategy that's going to be most effective. A comprehensive strategy really is what is, will make the difference. And um, we did study in Baltimore of various interventions um, including law enforcement strategies to reduce gun violence. And um, the one intervention that, that mirrored um, reductions in gun violence was by a, a special enforcement team in Baltimore that was, that was focused specifically on gun violence. Now, the, the challenge is that we also saw that that special enforcement team has been associated with civil rights abuses and, high, and discourtesy complaints um, and actual physical violence. Um, so you have to you know, weigh the, the, the costs and benefits of having law enforcement um, without checks and balances over those teams. Um, and they need to be focused very specifically on the, the gun violence activity. Um, and so, again, community-based strategies can work, but it is very important also, I talked about implementation challenges for the, some of the community-based strategies. You, um, you need to engage the community and you need to consider where there's accountability, where there are feedback loops in any of these strategies so that there can be checks and, and continually improvements made on the strategies. And, and that Baltimore study also evaluated some community-based? Yes. And how did those fare? Yes, so we looked at um, the, the Baltimore's version of the cure violence model. And again, it was found to have effects, um, reductions in gun violence in certain neighborhoods, um, but the, some of those effects did attenuate over time. And so we have seen that it, it can work. The community-based strategies do work um, and can be equally effective or even more effective than law enforcement strategies. We saw that um, some of the law enforcement strategies that were employed did not work at all. Um, some were associated with increases in gun violence rather than decreases. And so, again, it's important to consider a comprehensive strategy and to really engage the community in the process so that we, they are a part of the solution and we can have the kinds of accountabilities and checks that we need to make sure that any of these strategies are actually effective and, and making a difference, a positive difference in the communities. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cooper, so, uh, how did the, the evidence for violence interventions in the hospital compare to other kinds of things that hospitals might be investing in? Because, you know, uh, new surgical procedures, new surgical devices, sure. all those different things, how right, does this right. compare? Well, be clear, the, our nation's trauma centers do a excellent job of caring for <laughs> our patients who prevent violent injuries. And we, we save lives every day, and they're, we are constantly investing in new products and new techniques to save, to save those lives. So, so we do a good job overall. However, we are, are missing opportunities. Yeah. I can tell you one of the toughest jobs 
I have, a, one of the things that I do as a trauma surgeon is after spending four or five, whatever number of hours in, in working on someone and then failing and having to come out and talk to that family. It is the toughest job in it. You walk, you walk into the room and it seems like there may be only three people there, it seems like 10 or 15 sometime. You try to identify the most important member of the family and you focus on them and you can't say your loved one has sort of passed on. You can't say um, they've gone, you gotta say your, your daughter is dead or your son is dead. And then the scream that comes from that sometimes it's like, it's just, it reverberates through you. And all you can do is sit there and hold their hand or put their arm around them till they stop screaming. It is the toughest job that I do. Clearly, there are patients, the, the, the well, back, there are, the data shows, again, when those patients come back with violent injuries, they are more likely to die for whatever reasons. I mean, it's unclear why. Some people say it's because their immune system is depressed. It's more than likely because they have, it's more difficult to operate on someone a second or third time in their belly when they've had multiple operations. It's just more challenging. And so their likelihood of that, likelihood of that surgery being unsuccessful is more likely, more than likely. But that's, we don't, really don't know why are their, their death rate is higher, but, it, but it, it, it is higher. And that's why hospital-based sponsoring patients are helpful. Because there are, they, when they, because they, that higher percentage of folks who die when they come back, it's an opportunity um, to intervene in a way that hospitals, again, have already, have already, have already failed. And I can't emphasize how much what it does for the staff as well. Because if you're a surgeon or a nurse and you're sitting at ED and at trauma and they're constantly coming in, you get a little bit down after the third or fourth person comes in and dies. And having something else you can say that, you, you can say that especially if someone you've seen before, you know, we, I saw him a year ago, he come, he's died now. What could we have done different? And I think it's very, uh, it's a very important for the hospital staff to have, to be able to say, he's here, we saved him, we have an opportunity, we have something we can do now that can make sure that person doesn't come back again. So it gives the staff more hope rather than saying, you know, why are we doing this? He's just gonna come back in, 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 10, in 12 months. Why, 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 why are we wasting all these resources? I mean, I know it sounds a little callous, and, and I would like to say that, that never happens. We're humans. When you're seeing that, that I mean, that you, when, you're so, when you know those folks, that just patients are gonna come back again and you're spending, going to resources like MAD, those sort of things creep into folks' mind, I think. I, I wanna encourage people who are watching to, to join the conversation at the hashtag um, gun policies that work. But I wanna go back to you, Dr. Cooper, for a quick follow-up. So if this weren't gun violence, but you had an intervention that could have a similar impact as your gun violence intervention program on a serious illness. Say it was a, it was on car crash uh, mm -hmm. victims, or you know, and you could do something to have the same impact that hospitals could have if they implemented these policies. Mm -hmm. um, do you think people would say um, there's not enough evidence, or do you think if let's say there were a machine you could do and bill for, you know, what what would be the reaction? How does this compare to other things? that you know, hospitals might do? Well, I think that, um, that if it was something more concrete, I, I, I think that hospitals would, re would react uh, in a more of a, uh, more of a solid way going, yeah, that works, I, we're gonna institute that. It, it, it's, it's the fact that, um, that you, you have to, that there are, you, there, you have to have the, uh, the data is so dependent upon having a interaction with individuals uh, and impacting them uh, in a way that, uh, on social issues that hospitals aren't, hospitals aren't, uh, aren't really equipped to deal with the social issues mm -hmm. that, that bring these patients to the, to the hospital. And that's why, the, that's why having the hospital-based violence group, which is really uh, a group that's that that's able to not necessarily well, 
They're in, they're embedded into the hospital now, but often they are, they bring expertise outside the hospital. So I, I think that it, being able, um, part of the issue is being able to show them the data that says that it's not a, it's not a new, it's not a, a new anticoagulant, it's not a new tube you can put in, et cetera, but being able to say that we have the data that says addressing the social issues that, um, such as work, getting folks in jobs, substance abuse, et cetera, that hospitals aren't used to right. Yeah, it doing might be better than the new anti. Might be better to do yeah. yeah. But we, but one of our ourselves, we have to continue to provide the data that does that, and and oh, and more data that does that, so we can convince the not not it's not the trauma surgeon, but it's also convince the chief, the chief executive officer and the chief operating officer, all those folks who who have the money. Let's invest as in well that. as the insurers, as you point. As out, well as is the insurers, right? That's, Great, yeah. um, Dr. Brown. So. Question for you, how, how do these conversations generally go in cities? Is it a little easier sell now that you have randomized data? Or, and and what, what, what are the competing priorities and what's the evidence for those? Well, I just want to first say thank you so much and that gun violence is definitely in your lane of what you are supposed to be doing, <laughs> not just in the hospital but in the community. So we're so pleased that um, the hospitals are investing in this sort of thing and have been for quite some time, but unfortunately have not been recognized for that kind of community-based work. So, so cities are always doing trade-offs, and to Dr. Bugs's comment that it, you know, the, for most cities, one of the biggest line items in their budget is law enforcement. So most cities are investing a heavy amount of their funds into their law enforcement practices. And by the way, law enforcement works. We know from cities and some great experiments, in fact, cities like Kansas City, that law enforcement has the capacity to reduce gun violence and things like focused deterrence which Dr. Bugs was presenting, are this attempt to blend traditional law enforcement with more community-based programs. And so that's nice, and that helps to bring law enforcement into the community and to build community relationships. That being said, uh, there are two issues. One, which you raised, which, which is that um, law enforcement uh, and policing isn't always welcome in many of these communities. You know, when I said that we asked the community members what to do, about the violence in their neighborhoods, very few of those people said more police, to be quite honest with you. Um, so that, that's one thing. It's not that policing doesn't work, but the, the community relationships with our local law enforcement agencies is challenged. Now the mm -hmm. other thing that I will say, and one of the reasons that we as scientists began to pursue place-based interventions, is whether it's policing or interrupters, um, these person-based strategies where people have to be there, perhaps having a great impact in reducing gun violence, but that impact only lasts while they are there. So if you look at, for instance, if you watch The Interrupters as a documentary about the, the Cure Violence Program in the city of Chicago, it's doing quite, quite well until the money runs out. And the Interrupters can no longer be present in those communities, and the violence returns to those communities. <laughs> So uh, we really were thinking about these place-based strategies and a way to convince the municipalities and the policymakers and, and municipalities is that perhaps there's a bit more sustainability on these if they're married with other community-based programs that bring police or interrupters or other community-based uh, uh, practitioners into the field. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Gutis, do you see a more, more of an openness to funding research in this area now that this conversation has gained momentum nationally? Um, I think that you know we hear more about a desire to do some funding, but we're still not seeing any action on it. Okay. Um, I think where we're seeing the action has been on the state level for a few states and then from the private sector, from some, some foundations like Bloomberg who actually are funding some of the research and the uh, you know, uh, there's there's one or two other places that foundations are funding research, but well, certainly our hope as people yeah. watch this and really yeah. become familiar with just the the evidence that's there, yeah. really uh, being compelling and, and showing the value. Let's go to maybe some of the questions that have come in online. Yes, we have had a couple of questions, and I'll just provide you with two. Uh, first is if any of the panelists could talk a little bit more about gun violence prevention in schools, mm -hmm. and then also um, directly to Dr. Cooper. Does your program work with community partners in public health departments? 
Well, I'll start. Uh, so when we, um, we started our program, of course, it was just hospital-based, trying to work with folks who came there. But then we, it was obviously, clearly a question is, how can you work with patients before they get to your trauma center or three or four? So we, Michael? Yeah, it's OK. Yeah. Oh, it's dead. Sorry. <laughs> I'll talk a little louder. Um, so, so what we did then was we actually partnered with schools um, and began to go out and, and talk to, to them about, about uh, things that put them at risk of violence. We actually invited, we partnered with things like the, the, uh, the PALS program, post Athletic League, and had them bring groups to our hospital where we would talk about risk-based behavior. Uh, and we would, um, thank you. And we, when we would, uh, and we would give, we would, uh, we've given examples um, of uh, behavior that resulted in an injury to a patient, and asked him, "What would you do?" What would, you know, we, my classic example is this a kid that came to me in, in Baltimore, was playing basketball in Baltimore, and he saw some other kids show up. He knew they had a beef that other kids were playing basketball with, and he said, "Well, you know, I knew they're gonna, something's going to happen, but I, I'm having fun. I'm playing ball. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm winning. I stay on." And then, of course, what happened was he got shot and came to me. So we, we gave examples like that, that asked me, what should that kid have done differently? So, so we've gone to schools and tried uh, to do those kinds of things and partnering with, partnering with schools. And the second question was, is your program working with community partners in health departments as well? I, I, absolutely. I, I think that we, we welcome any partner uh, who can uh, help uh, with education, can help uh, with uh, funding, can help with getting access to our, uh, to the communities that can result in our patient lives being saved. Uh, uh, we, for a quick example, for, for the health hospital-based programs, we, we, this is our 10th year now, all of the processes and intake forms, et cetera, we share. There's no copyright on any of it. We share it with any place that wants to uh, develop a hospital-based program. Uh, we will go out to, we travel to many cities, uh, sometimes on our own dime, to help them be educated and walk through the process of building programs. Again, simply because we feel very strongly and, and our growing data shows that it saves lives. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, on the, the topic of gun violence in schools, um, there have been um, replications of the cure violence model. Um, some violence interrupters and, and outreach workers are, are reaching into the schools. And, and helping to mediate conflicts within the schools, but also providing mentorship and support for the young people who are at greatest risk for violence. Um, but one thing that we also see um, is that young people frequently, you know, when, when young people have, have guns on them in school, they've been arming themselves because of their commute to school. Um, they are, they are tra passing through my mic is out too. They are, thank you. They are passing through dangerous neighborhoods to get to schools. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is really important to think about the environment, as, as Dr. Brand has talked about, um, that, that young people are having to traverse to get to and from school, um, in addition to, to providing them support. Um, the, the question was raised earlier about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences um, for, for mass shooters, but you know, it, as, as was pointed out by the previous panel, um, that is, that is a, a common feature. Um, Dr. Cooper mentioned it as well. These individuals who are at greatest risk for violence have had extensive trauma um, in their backgrounds and, and really do need support and mentorship um, and connection to services. And so some programs are reaching into the schools to help identify um, and support those young people. Great. Question? Um, good morning. You. Good morning. Uh, thank you today for um, all of the panelists and um, all of the great information being shared. My name is Amy Moyer and I work for Kaiser Permanente. And um, as many know, we're an integrated health system. And I have two questions. I promise not to be long-winded, um, but everything you're saying resonates with um, where I come from. And I work in the department that does a lot of um, the community investments 
and grants um, for com community benefit. So it's not only investments for um, our members in the community, but the communities and where we operate. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the areas that we focused on most recently based on an environmental scan is um, West Baltimore and the 21223 zip code. And um, we created a place space in an initiative called Future Baltimore. Um, and through, it's, it took about a three, three year process, but um, we joined with Bon Secours and some other uh, nonprofit organizations. But to date, we've done 1,200 screenings for behavioral health services. This is all with community feedback is what they wanted. 100 certified nursing assistants graduated from programs that we created. Um, we have 11 micro businesses graduated from an incubator program and they've already received 100,000 in loans. 75 families per week receive fresh produce and six million in capital was raised for a community resource center which the community said they wanted. And we, we provided two million, our initial investment was two million. I'm saying all this to say that it took a lot of um, energy and um, buy-in from other nonprofits or other private institutions. And so I guess I would say is um, providing the business case, even the research, research is there, what would you say would be um, the top things that organizations like ours and others could do to get involved in something like this as either corporate social responsibility or um, not as only a means to prevent violence, looking at the root causes, social determinants of health, but um, how can people get involved with this knowing, because we operate from the standpoint of social de determinants of health. And so um, that's the first question. The second one is about hospital interventions, but I'll let you answer that first. Uh, wh why don't you go ahead and quickly ask the second one? Okay. So the second, the second one is last year we also contributed two million to um, gun violence research. And um, when you mentioned the hospital intervention, some of the things that our physicians and clinicians thought were important to do research on was, one, evaluating a web-based education tool for safe firearm storage in patients at risk for suicide, and then understanding risk factors of firearm-related injuries and death in adult and pediatric populations and then integration of firearm suicide prevention tools in healthcare settings. So that's the patient reported access to firearms and decision aid for storing the firearms. Would you say those are three areas that could be incorporated with the hospital-based in interventions that Dr. Cooper spoke about? Well, thank you for your, for your question. And I should also say that Kaiser has been a very good supporter of the Health Alliance of Violence Intervention. We are at our, at our annual meeting, our 10th annual meeting, this past September, you were a supporter and we're, we're very thankful for that. We try very hard um, to make sure that we educate our, our clients um, and any patient comes to the hospital with injuries on the kinds of things that we, that we talk about. I mean, we have, we have those, with our clients, we have those, we have those very tough questions about are you still carrying a, a weapon? Is there a weapon inside your, inside your home? Um, we try to make sure that we hold our clients accountable. We're investing in them. They're part of our program. So we do have those tough questions uh, with our clients themselves. We've, we've not uh, gotten more broadly in having those questions in the general population of, of, our, of our hospital. But those are things that are, again, at least being discussed as we try to broaden the, uh, the, uh, our, our success efforts. Great. And thank you. Any, anyone else interested in responding? And we should use these mics if can, we're going to do it. I'll, I'll yeah. happy to use that. I'm happy to answer, try to answer your first question. So first, wonderful work that's being done in West Baltimore. Congratulations. I'd love to see it. Um, and it speaks to this notion, and Dr. Cooper will know this, of course, is that healthcare is really not simply about what happens in the walls of the clinic whether that be the walls of the hospital or the walls of some satellite outpatient clinic, the providers need to understand the context from within which their patients emerge because if you keep issuing the same treatment to them when they show up at your clinic, they're gonna to return to a chaotic and a difficult environment that's not gonna permit that treatment to work. So that's the first reason that you need to be thinking, well, I'm not saying you necessarily, that, that the health systems need to be thinking about 
beyond just the walls of, of their clinic. Now, the other thing I'll say is that I'm going to applaud you, but say that there's not enough of this going on and emerging from health healthcare systems around the nation. The other great example that I have in mind is Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, in Columbus, Ohio, that uh, has just built hundreds of homes, built and rebuilt hundreds of homes in their surrounding area in Columbus. Um, and they're, they're reaping the benefits of that in terms of the cost savings because folks who've been showing up over and over again to that hospital might not be coming back uh, over and over again for very various issues, including uh, acts of violence and violent injury. So there are a lot of benefits here, and I'm so glad to see that your health system and others are really investing in, in this, not simply um, offering it lip service, but going into the communities to do actual programs and to, to perform actions in those communities to, to try to address this. And I would just say, I think it raises the question also for businesses where their line of business is relevant to gun violence. And we've seen some businesses stop selling certain types of guns. You know, think about that. For a healthcare business, it's also about opening clinics, you know. And um, West Baltimore is a real uh, desert when it comes to primary care. And I think there's been an interest in a long time in more primary care in West Baltimore, which could combine with some of the great investments that Kaiser is making on the social determinant side. Um, Thank you. Great. Uh, Hi. Josh. Josh Horowitz, yes. the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. I want to think about some systemic issues that might link this incredible important discussion about urban gun violence with rural, rural suicide issues. So we're seeing a complete, you know, at some of these cities we're hearing about this disinvestment, lack, you just, Dr. Sharfstein brought up the lack of mental health services in some of these communities. We're seeing that actually mirrored, I think, in rural America as well, where you see some of these, some cities with really, you know, empty storefronts, blighted buildings, blighted parks, no access to services. Do you think some of the strategies that we're talking about here in this panel could be applied, for, for instance, in rural America to deal with some of the suicide crisis we're going on? And maybe Dr. Brannis, you can start with that. Because I'm really, I was really taken with your discussion of sort of, of, of. of putting parks in and putting and, and getting rid of blight. And that's something you, th the more you spend time in rural America now, you're seeing that being mirrored in small towns all across the country. So I just wonder if there's some commonalities we can sort of bring together here. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the reasons I said that in big cities, mid-sized cities, but also small cities, which were uh, disproportionately affected by the Great Recession, frankly. So rural and semi-rural America is very challenged by this, as you're saying. And, but then I'm going to put my hands up and say that we haven't devoted the research energy that we should um, in terms, particularly in terms of place-based interventions um, for these, the challenges of rural America, uh, particularly for suicide and gun suicide, for, that we have, you know, the $300 million that went to the opioid crisis, much of it was focusing on, on the rural crisis. We haven't even scratched the surface for what's right coming up right under that, which is uh, suicide and gun suicide, particularly in rural communities where the risk is even higher um, than in our cities. Um, I, the one thing I will say that we've been thinking about is this, I don't know if any of you have followed, but the UK has uh, created a minister of loneliness. Um, so in, in, in the UK, they really are addressing loneliness as a health concern, a major health concern that's driving a number of different things. And I think there are opportunities to begin to think about that and perhaps some strategies that have emerged um, from folks who are thinking about uh, addressing these issues of loneliness, particularly isolation that occurs in rural areas, and applying them here and seeing if they have some kind of an effect uh, on particular rural and semi-rural gun suicide. Thank you. Um, next question. Hi, good, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for um, all of the information that all of you have been sharing, both on this panel and the previous one. My name is Ruhi Bengali. Uh, I'm going to keep my question short. I was just wondering if any of you could speak a little bit about policies and practices that address police violence specifically, so much of which is gun violence, um, and that doesn't quite get the attention within the gun violence space as it should, um, and really undercuts um, at least in my view, so many of these programs that you shared about, because it really is sort of what is um, driving the mistrust um, of police in those communities. Yeah. Um, there has not been enough research on police violence. Um, that is, you're absolutely right. It is a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, when you talk to community members about what 
they need, and the community is most impacted by gun violence, and about what they need to feel safe. As Dr. Brennis said, um, there, there's not a call for, for more police. Often there is a call for no police because of the history, because of you know, the many stories of concerns about police violence. And police-involved shootings um, receive, you know, similar to mass shootings, they receive the most public attention. Um, but there are also concerns about harassment and humiliation and, um, you know, disparagement. And so there needs to be more research on that. And um, I believe that the strategies, there, it's quite possible that many of the strategies that have been discussed could also help address police violence. And, and there needs to be um, real, you know, honest conversations around how the police engage with communities. Um, and is it the kind of engagement that, that the communities want? And too often, Communities are not part of the conversation. It is a top-down um, assumption about what, how communities should be policed, and it is not working. We continue to see high rates of gun violence in communities where there are high police presences. And so the, the strategies that have been used are, are not working. The investments in, in public safety, focusing only on law enforcement, um, is is not is not gaining the 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 lives that we want to save, and so you're absolutely right. But there needs to be a lot more research on police violence and its relationship to violence in the communities. Thank you. Maybe we're close to the last couple questions here. Go ahead. We're both fielding some from our live stream audience. Dr. Brandis, um, some people would like to know. You talked a little bit about anti-blight ordinances, and you said there are good ones and there are impotent ones good ones and impotent ones? And they wanted to know, did you have kind of maybe a short list of what a good anti-blight ordinance contained? I think, so there are good ones, impotent ones, and completely absent ones. So, so we have to start somewhere and put some in place. And ones that don't function as well don't give um, the city the capacity to make changes. Um, it mires the opportunity even after perhaps um, an owner of a, of a blighted property has not, cannot be identified or has passed away or has not been uh, an owner of that property for decades, cities, many cities in the absence of an ordinance or an ordinance that doesn't function strongly enough, um, it will take the city much too much time to be able to act. Um, you know, as researchers, when we do our, our, our research and go into communities and change these properties, the community doesn't think we're coming from a university. They think that um, we're coming from city government oftentimes. Uh, and they, the common response is, uh, we called you 30 years ago, no joke. We called you 20 or 30 years ago to do this and we gave up after a while. So I, I think that some communities do have these mechanisms, some cities do have these mechanisms, but they're just mired in, in, in red tape and they're not streamlined enough to be able to get in there and make the change on behalf of the neighbors. We have another question from Twitter, and it's about funding. And the question was, even when funding has been allocated, it's often not released appropriately, or it doesn't go to the programs that truly support the policy. How do we overcome those hurdles? Um, no, that's a good question. I think, I think there's a number of things. I think it depends on where the funding is going to, so where the money is appropriated to you as far as funding goes. Um, when you talk from a federal level, of funding, there are you know some agencies are more likely to maybe follow their own priority research agenda than maybe a, a more general research agenda. So it really depends on that. Um, I think the it, it depends on where the research is going to get done um, and what they've made decisions about as far as where that money is going for the research. Are they keeping it internally or are they? giving it to independent researchers. And I think those are some critical issues because you do have places where the research is done in-house. Um, and when you talk about things that are governmental and it's done in-house, there's more politicization of that kind of research than there might be, than there would be in an academic environment or in research that is funded perhaps by a um, private entity or you know by a foundation. So um, a lot of it has to do with how how the money is appropriated to the distributor of the funds, I guess, is the best way to say it. Great. 
Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking this great panel. Stay here. Maybe I'll ask Dr. Benjamin if you wanted just to come up. I'll ask you to give the couple any closing thoughts you might have. But while you're coming up, I will um, just say how uh, pleased I am with how today went and the fantastic uh, discussion we just had. And um, just share three, three of my own um, thoughts first. Um, well, I think what we heard today is we did not hear people who were trying to change the standards of evidence. They're actually trying to get people to pay attention. We're all trying to get people to pay attention to the evidence that exists, because the evidence that exists for policies at work is quite strong um, and compares very well to, in many cases, exceeds the evidence that supports other kinds of interventions um, for similar challenges or even violence itself. Number two is, um, while it's important to have more research, um, there is a lot of evidence, and you don't need perfect knowledge of everything in order to take action. And so um, we really heard very clear recommendations based on the research that exists, even though um, it's very important to continue to, to, um, to push the envelope in terms of understanding what works. And then number three, I think there is every reason to believe. What we heard was that this has been an area of very little money and very little um, uh, research, really. And even with that, um, we have real knowledge about what can save many lives. There is every reason to believe that with further investment, we can answer and improve some of the uh, challenges that we know are still there, challenges like how to best enforce um, uh, some of the uh, uh, different legislation around guns. Um, challenges like how to get um, hospitals to effectively implement um, some policies that can reduce recidivism and injury. Uh, challenges like improving policing practices and community trust and how to uh, maintain fidelity to mo of models of community-based intervention so that more communities can benefit over time. All of these things are possible. Um, and today, I hope, was an opportunity for people to really not just get a, a, a vision of what um, can be accomplished with what we know today, but just the fact that we can be, as a nation, on a trajectory for substantial improvement. Dr. Benjamin. You know, we're, we're at a really extraordinary moment in our, uh, in our nation, I think. And, you know, every time we have a tragedy that gets the attention of the media, uh, we always hear that familiar phrase of um, giving people hopes and support. And people should have hope and support. But, you know, this is an opportunity for us to actually do something about that. Um, thinking a problem in a way does not make it go away. Bad news does not get better with time. It never has, and it never will. Um, we put people in policymaking positions for them to help us as a collective uh, to move uh, things forward. Um, what stimulated this particular forum was the last mass shooting that we, we had. Um, but again, I just remind you that each and every day we have a tragedy that occurs and many tragedies that occur in our community. Um, we also often get asked why the public health community is so concerned about that and whether or not this is our lane. But I want to be real clear about this. If it hurts people or kills people, it's ours. Now, it's not ours alone, but we do have an opportunity to gather with people in other disciplines, in health, in the criminal justice world, um, the public safety world, and policymakers to make a difference. What we hope to do today was give you a series of our thoughts about policies that work to reduce gun violence. Well, we're hoping that as our nation has this very intense debate over the next several days to weeks over how best to make our communities safer and reduce the carnage that occurs from firearms in the context of legal authorities in the Second Amendment, we've given you some ideas of what will work and how we can move this nation forward. With that, I thank you. And please give all of our speakers a great round of applause. And we look forward to working with anyone 
that wants to make a difference. Thank you very much.